Really would Afghanistan. And to hear from the generals who advised President Biden against his disastrous foreign policy decision. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. On April 14th, 2021, President Biden announced the United States would unilaterally withdraw its military forces from Afghanistan. For months before that announcement, the intelligence community and his senior military advisors, including both gentlemen testifying here today, issued dire warnings about the withdrawal's consequences. After the announcement, I, along with other Republican and Democrat members of Congress, urged the president to prepare for the withdrawal and its inevitable fallout. Unfortunately, those warnings were ignored. As the withdrawal date neared, the situation in Afghanistan deteriorated as the Taliban gained significant ground across the country. Yet the Biden administration's failure to plan for their withdrawal threatened the safety and security of U.S. personnel in the country. As a result, in July of 2021, 23 State Department employees in Kabul sent a dissent cable channel to Secretary Blinken warning of their grave concerns for Afghanistan's stability and for their own safety. Yet nothing was done. Instead, our investigation uncovered the White House refused to listen to warnings about the situation on the ground. Disturbingly, we have uncovered that State Department leadership prohibited, prohibited its employees from even uttering the word NEO, shorthand for emergency evacuation, until as late as August of 2021. Too little, too late. Additionally, this committee learned that the State Department did not even request an emergency evacuation until after Kabul was surrounded by the Taliban. As a result, the airport was not secured until August 17th, two days after Kabul fell. As the saying goes, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And fail, they did. The next two weeks created an international outrage and humiliation for the United States. People all over the world watched as babies were flung over barbed wire fence by mothers without hope. Desperate Afghans fell to their deaths from airplanes and hordes of people surrounded the airport as they tried to flee for their lives. The damage to our reputation and our credibility, the United States credibility around the world, that damage will last for generations. Our service members were forced to watch as American citizens and Afghan allies were beaten and murdered outside the gates of the airport. These brave Americans were told to stand by as terrorists brutalized innocent civilians. And then, then on the morning of August 26, we watched in horror as reports of a terrorist attack at Abbey Gate flooded the news. 13 U.S. service members were murdered, with dozens more injured. 170 Afghans were killed, with countless injured as well. Some of the Abbey Gate Gold Star families members are here today, and we honor you. We honor your sacrifice here today. To the families here today and to the American people, I say, I will not rest until I get to the bottom of this tragedy. You deserve answers. The American people deserve answers. And I intend to deliver. When the last U.S. military plane left on August 30th, 2021, more than 1,000 American citizens remained trapped in Afghanistan, as were tens of thousands of Afghan allies who risked their lives serving beside our troops and diplomats. M many, if not most, of those allies are still trapped, constantly in fear for their lives. I want to thank both of our witnesses for being here today. Despite current DOD officials actively trying to limit your testimony, 
you have agreed to appear here voluntarily. And I'm grateful to you, both of you, sirs, for your service to our country and your service to this investigation. I also want to thank the Abigail Gold Star families for joining us here today. And while the president has never publicly stated the names of your children, I will here today. Their names are Darren Hoover, Johanny Rosario, Nicole G, Hunter Lopez, Dagan Page, Humberto Sanchez, David Espinoza, Jared Schmitz, Riley McCollum, Dylan Marola, Karim Nakui, Maxton Soviak, and Ryan Noss. Those are the names of the fallen. May God bless them. They will not be forgotten. And with that, uh, the chair now recognizes the ranking member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And let me start by thanking former chairman of the Chief of Staffs, General Mark A. Milley, and former commander of the United States Central Command, General Kenneth F. McKenzie, Jr., for testifying before this committee today and sharing, as you did before, the House Armed Services Committee in 2021 key military and policy insights on the United States withdrawal from Afghanistan. I also want to thank you both for the years of sacrifice and service to our great country and recognize the hundreds of thousands of American service members, diplomats, and development professionals that worked to support the United States efforts in Afghanistan over the course of our presence in the country. I want to also recognize the 2,461 American military personnel who gave their life in Afghanistan for our country. And of course, that includes who my heart bleeds for, the 13 brave Americans who were killed in an ISIS terrorist attack while facilitating the evacuation of 124,000 people over the course of 17 days in August of 2021. And as I've previously said, President Biden's efforts to end the 20-year war in Afghanistan and bring our troops home was the right one. And while that decision was in our country's best interest, a number of contributing factors complicated the withdrawal, namely President Ghani fleeing Afghanistan on August 15th, 2021, and the resulting collapse of the Afghan government. As we heard in our hearing just last month from former Special Representative for Afghanistan Reco Reconciliation, Zalmi Kilazad, President, former President Donald Trump's Doha deal empowered the Taliban at the expense of the Afghan government. The Trump administration's commitment to facilitate the release of Taliban prisoners in Afghan and the Afghan government, that they were there in their custody and initiated significant unilateral U.S. troop download that drawdowns placed the Taliban in the strongest position since the United States first arrived in Afghanistan 20 years earlier. Continued troop drawdowns, despite the Taliban not fully complying with terms of the Doha Agreement, undercut the United States leverage with the Taliban. During the transition between the Trump and Biden administrations, it also became clear that the Trump administration lacked a comprehensive plan for withdrawing from Afghanistan despite the May 1st deadline fast approaching. Upon taking office, President Biden conducted a thorough interagency review and determined he had two options. The president could either continue the withdrawal 
started by his predecessor, or break the agreement and return us to an active war with the Taliban, a decision that would necessitate a significant surge of troops for an, indefined, an undefined time. The Taliban made clear that backing out of the Doha agreement would result in the resumption of hostilities, which would place our service members once more in their crosshairs. Let me be clear. This is not my opinion on the timeline and facts. This is the picture painted by the Afghanistan After Review, After Action Report, conducted by the State Department, which DOD has corroborated throughout its own internal reviews of the withdrawal. These are the facts outlined by this committee's own investigation, which has been comprised of over 100 hours of transcribed testimony, multiple public hearings, and 11,000 pages of documents produced by the State <coughs> Department. And I also, again, like to reinforce the importance of broadening the scope of Afghanistan. Proper oversight of, of, of Afghanistan requires an honest look back, not just at a few months, but at the entire 20 years of war over four administrations. Generals Milley and McKenzie, so I look forward to your continued commitment to truth and transparency today, helping us gain a better understanding so we may learn from our successes and mistakes. And I want to commend the efforts of all who contributed to the successful evacuation and airlift of 124,000 people from Afghanistan. We understand over the course of our interviews and investigations that this was an all-hands-on-deck undertaking. And while I'm thankful such an airlift was successful given the dynamic and chaotic situation on the ground, we must also scrutinize the lessons learned, including from the tragic bombing at Abbey Gate. So I look forward to hearing how the Defense Department, similar to the states, Afghanistan's AAR, has taken efforts to assess and learn from our withdrawal so that we do not repeat those mistakes uh, in the future. Let me close just by saying I would like also to make special mention of our previously bipartisan commitment to ensuring special immigrant visas for the Afghan allies who worked with U.S. service members and diplomats throughout our mission in Afghanistan. Thus far, the Republican leadership in the House is refusing to increase the SIVs to the administration's requested amount. So I know Chairman McCall and the majority of members on this committee agree that Congress must act on fulfilling our promises to them, and I hope to have your support in working with Democrats on getting that done. And with that, I yield. Uh, Ring member yields. Let me add, add uh, to that comment. We are working in a very bipartisan manner to increase the number of SIVs. I think it's, it's vitally important uh, when we talk about Afghan partners left behind to provide the visas necessary for them to get out of there. And um, I'm pleased to announce, but I don't want to announce the number yet because it's being negotiated that we will have an agreement. So uh, with that, uh, uh, I'm pleased to have with us here today um, the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley, and former commander of U.S. Central Command, General Kenneth F. McKenzie, Jr. Both generals played a pivotal role throughout the Afghanistan uh, withdrawal, but also a pivotal role throughout our nation's history uh, in many conflicts. And I, I commend you for your service uh, to our nation. Your full statements will be made a part of the record. And I'll ask that each of you keep your remarks uh, to five minutes. And uh, finally, as a reminder, today's hearing is subject to the veracity protections of Section 1001 of Title 18 of the United States Code, which makes it a crime to knowingly make any false, fictitious, or fraudulent statements to the committee in the context of this investigation. With that, I now recognize General Mark Milley for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman McCall and Ranking Member Meeks and members of the committee, and thank you for your efforts and what you're doing. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here with General McKenzie, and my purpose here today is to help you form a holistic assessment of our efforts in Afghanistan. But most importantly, I am personally here today voluntarily to help the families of the fallen, the 13 fallen at Abbey Gate, and the thousands of fallen and tens of thousands of wounded and countless other members 
who suffered the invisible wounds of war to help them get answers. I'm humbled to be here today with three Gold Star families from Abbey Gate, and I know the other families couldn't make it, but I intend to contact them in the coming weeks. They know my feelings for them. They know that there are no words by me or any general or any politician or anyone that can ever bring back their fallen. But all of us can and all of us must honor their sacrifice to protect our country and to be forever grateful that they answered the call to the colors. Each of them paid the ultimate sacrifice on the altar of freedom, like so many before them, in order to keep our nation safe. And we owe them answers. And I am committed to assist in the effort to get them answers. But we should also not be under any illusion. We're not going to get all the answers here today. It's a process that's going to take a considerable length of time. And we must also recognize that much of the record, in fact, is classified and beyond the scope of this open hearing. So over two decades, between 2001 and 2021, about 800,000 of us in uniform in the United States military served in Afghanistan and thousands of others from many agencies in our government. Of those 2,461 soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines gave their lives. Almost 30,000 more were wounded in action and countless author others suffered those invisible wounds. And that includes the 13 from Abbey Gate we must always honor all of their sacrifice, each of them, over two decades of fighting the Taliban, bringing Osama bin Laden to justice, and ultimately protecting the American homeland. We lost over 200 US and international troops and many more wounded in action in units that were under my direct command in several tours and multiple years of combat in both Iraq and Afghanistan. And every commander who's ever served in combat knows that we personally issued the orders that gave the task, the purpose, the place, and the time of that soldier's death or wounds. And we also know it was the enemy that killed or wounded them. Combat's an unforgiving environment, and those of us who have served in the brutality of ground combat live with that dark reality every day and every night. And we'll live with that for the rest of the days of our lives. There's no military leader who's lost troops in combat who does not know that feeling. So this is personal to me, and I will do everything in my power to ensure that these families and all of our veterans and families know the truth and have the answers. At the peak of our military commitment in 2011, the United States had just over 100,000, or just under 100,000 troops and about 20,000 DOD contractors. That same year, the United States began to steadily draw down troops, close bases, and retrograde equipment. Nothing we're going to discuss today happened overnight. It was a process of withdrawal that spanned a decade. The outcome in Afghanistan was the cumulative effect of many decisions over many years of war. And like any complex phenomena, there's no single causal factor that determined the outcome, but multiple factors in combination. In the fall of 2020, as I previously testified publicly, my analysis, my personal analysis, was that an accelerated withdrawal would likely lead to the general collapse of the Afghan security forces and the Afghan government resulting in a large-scale civil war reminiscent of the 1990s or a complete Taliban takeover. In November 2020, DOD received orders from the White House to reduce troop levels to 2,500 by January 15, 21. When the current administration took office in January 21, there were roughly speaking 2,500 U.S. troops on the ground with about 22,000 NATO troops and contractors. Beginning in February 21, the National Security Council conducted a 10-week interagency review of the Doha Agreement, and various options were presented and debated. In previous public testimony, I noted that at that time, my analysis based on my assessment and the recommendations of the commanders, to include General McKenzie, and the consensus of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, was that we needed to maintain a minimum force of 2,500 troops on the ground, mostly special forces, with allied troops and contractors, in order to sustain the Afghan National Security Forces and its government until the diplomatic conditions of the Doha Agreement were met. Without this support, it was my view at the time that it was only a matter of when, not if, the Afghan government would collapse and the Taliban would take control. Again, I previously publicly testified, and I consistently supported a negotiated end of the war, but only 
if there was a reduction in violence leading to a permanent ceasefire, and there were Afghan-to-Afghan -Afghan negotiations leading to a power-sharing agreement between the Afghan government and the Taliban. And it was my view that absent those conditions, I was not in favor of a unilateral withdrawal of U.S. forces because of my assessment of the associated costs and risks. The fundamental t tension facing the president, in fact, two presidents, was that no one could satisfactorily explain when or even if those conditions would ever be met. And if we stayed indefinitely, an open war would likely begin with the Taliban again with increased risk of additional casualties. On 14 April 21, President Biden made the formal announcement of his decision to honor the Doha Agreement with a mil military withdrawal while maintaining a continued diplomatic presence. The Department of Defense understood that our mission was to conduct a retrograde of the remaining U.S. military forces and equipment while leaving a small contingent to defend the American Embassy while diplomatic outcomes were negotiated. On 14 August, the non-combatant evacuation operation decision was made by the Department of State and the U.S. military alerted, marshaled, mobilized, and rapidly deployed faster than any military in the world could ever do. It is my assessment that that decision came too late. The deploying forces quickly took operational control of the airport with significant elements of the 82nd Airborne Division, Marines, National Guard, and Special Forces, along with our CIA partners and selected NATO forces. Additionally, we set up multiple bases to process evacuees in other countries throughout the Middle East, Europe, and CONUS. In short, the United States military performed one of the most incredible evacuations under pressure in recorded history in an extremely difficult, dynamic, and dangerous environment. That performance is due to the individual bravery, competence, and compassion of every private to general who had any role in this NEO. At the end of 20 years, we, the military, helped build an army, a state, but we could not forge a nation. The enemy occupied Kabul, the overthrow of the government occurred, and the military we supported for two decades faded away. That is a strategic failure. But the military also provided hope for 20 years to the Afghan people. We provided unprecedented opportunity to millions. In the final days, we gave 130,000 people their lives and freedom at very high cost. And most importantly, we protected the United States from terrorist attack from Afghanistan, which was our original mission, and that mission continues today. There are many lessons to be learned from 20 years of war and the 10-year drawdown of forces and the final evacuation. And Mr. Chairman, I have a lengthier paper uh, for a written testimony that I would like to submit for the record with your permission. Without objection, so ordered. To the American people, the most important lesson I think to learn is that your troops the United States military, from private to general, did all that bravery and duty could ever do. Your military defended you successfully for 20 years and continues to do that. And for that, every American should be eternally grateful. To all the veterans of Afghanistan, hold your heads high, and I know there are several in the room today. Know that you did your duty. Each of you did what your country asked of you under extreme circumstances. Many of you, like Congressman Mass, lost limbs and were grievously wounded. And you did it selflessly with professionalism, courage, compassion, and with great sacrifice. And finally, to the Gold Star families that are here with us today and those that couldn't make it, there's nothing that I can say or do that's going to fill that gaping hole in your heart. But as I've told you before, I'm committed, and I will honor that commitment to get you the answers, to get you to the truth. And I will personally, and I know everyone else will as well, honor your sacrifice and the sacrifice of your loved one. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, General Milley. I now recognize General McKenzie for his opening statement. Chairman, thank you. And I'd like to ask that this opening for the record. The microphone. Submitted for the record. Got it. I'd like to ask that this opening statement be submitted for the record. Without objection, so ordered. Chairman McCall, Ranking Member Meeks, distinguished members of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, I'm here to voluntarily testify today about the military component of our withdrawal from Afghanistan. Before I begin, I'd like to recognize the Gold Star families that are here today. I hope that what we discuss today will reduce their pain. I, like General Milley, I am humbled to be in their presence here today. As you are aware, in September 2021, I provided over 10 hours of open and closed testimony on this subject to the two congressional committees charged with oversight of military operations, the House Armed Services Committee and the Senate Armed Services Committee. 
Much of my testimony will, be of, necess will of necessity mirror that earlier transcribed testimony. As a theater commander, I will confine my opening remarks to those matters that were under my direct operational control, specifically the withdrawal of U.S. military forces and the subsequent non-combatant evacuation operation, or NEO. These were two distinct and separate operations. We had detailed, constantly updated plans for each of them. We executed both of those plans, although separated in time. And thanks to the valor and dedication of thousands of men and women in harm's way, we completed both missions, but not without loss of life. We honor the 13 brave Americans who died at Abbey Gate, joining the uh, over 2,400 other service members who lost their lives in this 20-year campaign. Their sacrifice stands with those of our coalition partners and, of course, the Afghans who fought beside us for so many years. I briefed President Trump on a plan to completely depart Afghanistan on 3 June 2020. This plan envisioned the complete withdrawal of all our forces and our diplomats and citizens. It also contemplated the possible withdrawal of Afghans who had served with us. The plan had a number of options, but it was the framework for everything that followed. Ultimately, President Trump selected a branch of the plan that maintained 2,500 U.S. military personnel in Afghanistan by Inauguration Day in January 2021. We had branches to that plan to complete a withdrawal by May of 2021 had we been so ordered. On 11 April 2021, I received orders from President Biden through the Secretary of Defense to execute a full military withdrawal by 11 September 2021, a date which was subsequently modified to the end of August. This decision did not include the withdrawal of our embassy, our citizens, and at-risk Afghans. It's important to understand that we had a complete plan to execute that task as well, but were not ordered to do so. The president's decision was to maintain an embassy, to not require our citizens to leave, and of course, to not expedite the extraction of at-risk Afghans. This was not a military decision. We substantially accomplished the military withdrawal by 12 July 2021, when I relieved General Scott Miller as the commander of U.S. forces in Afghanistan. My orders then were to retain a military platform of 650 personnel solely designed to provide security for the U.S. Embassy and Karzai International Airport. During this period, and with minimal to no support from us, the Afghan security forces, and more importantly, the government of Afghanistan, crumbled in the face of Taliban pressure. Orders to commence the non-combatant evacuation operation, bringing out our embassy, our citizens, and at-risk Afghans, were received on 14 August. These dates are important because I believe that the events of mid and late August 2021 were the direct result of delaying the initiation of the NEO for several months. In fact, until we were in extremis and the Taliban had overrun the country. As you are aware, the decision to begin a NEO rests with the Department of State, not the Department of Defense. Despite this, we had begun positioning forces in the region as early as 9 July, but we could do nothing nothing to commence the operation, the evacuation, until a NEO was declared. Our operations at Karzai International from 14 August through our ultimate departure on early 31 August were both heroic and tragic. This was a combat operation of the most difficult sort, carried out in contact with the enemy. We eventually put 5,784 U.S. troops, almost 2,000 more coalition and other forces, eight U.S. maneuver battalions on the ground at Karzai International. I'd like to talk a little bit now about Abbey Gate. It was a tragic event, one of many that have occurred over our 20-year engagement in Afghanistan. It, remain, it remains my opinion that if there is culpability in this attack, it lies in policy decisions that created the environment of August 2021 in Kabul. Culpability and responsibility do not lie with the troops on the ground who perform magnificently. It does not lie with the platoon, company, or battalion commanders are the flag officers who oversaw operations on the ground in Kabul. The simple fact is this. On the battlefield, even with good planning, tremendous execution by brave people on the ground, the enemy sometimes has success. To ignore this fact is to ignore the fundamental reality of the battlefield. If there's fault, it lies in a policy decision that placed the joint force in this situation and exposed the force over time to the possibility of these kinds of attacks. We did not rely on the Taliban for our security. We used them as one tool among many to beef up our defensive posture. We avoided a number of potential Abbey Gate attacks. 
and I'm proud of the commanders and troops who prevented them. This is small comfort to those who lost loved ones, and I realize this. Nonetheless, what's remarkable about Kabul is not that the tragedy of Abbey Gate happened, but that many other attacks did not happen. I'll end my statement with this observation. I was the overall commander, and I and I alone bear full military responsibility for what happened at Abbey Gate. Thank you, Chairman. I'm ready for questions. Uh, thank you, General McKenzie. I now recognize myself for questions. Uh, we have a Sergeant Tyler Vargas Andrews here today. I want to thank you, sir, for your service uh, and your courage for testifying before this committee almost a year ago to the day. He was a sniper at Abbey Gate and testified to us that he had the suicide bomber in his sights, that identified, was identified on the be on the lookout. He sent the sniper photos and other related documents to his commanding officer for permission to engage the suicide bomber. Yet that warning was ignored. He never heard back. I and the chairman of the Armed Services Committee, after that testimony, sent a letter to the Department of Defense requesting that these documents and sniper photos be delivered to the Congress, produced to the Congress by this, this document, this letter request. To date, that has been ignored. The Department of Defense has refused. We've also requested the testimonies of General Chris Donahue and Admiral Peter Vasely, who were the commanding officers on the ground during the Abbey Gate disaster. To both of you, to General Milley, do you think that these documents should be turned over to the United States Congress? And do you think that both General Donahue and Admiral Vasely should testify before Congress? Sure, I absolutely do. I believe transparency. You're the board of directors for this corporation called the American government, and, and I, I believe that you're entitled to those within the bounds of classification, absolutely. So whatever documents are out there uh, should be turned over to the appropriate committees of jurisdiction and, and oversight, uh, and whatever witnesses are needed to establish truth and transparency within the bounds of classification should absolutely happen. Absolutely. That's why I'm here. Thank you. Uh, Chairman, I agree, with, I agree with General Milley, and I associate myself with his remarks. So also on accountability, I've asked the State Department uh, officials who was responsible for the catastrophic emergency evacuation. Not surprisingly, they point their fingers at the Department of Defense. But I want to set the record straight. While the DOD helps conduct the emergency evacuation, it's a State Department that is responsible under law for developing the plan and leading the evacuation. Is that your understanding? Yes, uh, the State Department is the lead federal agency uh, for planning and execution, oversight of the execution of the non-combatant operation. And the Department of Defense is in support of, and other departments are in support of the State Department. But the State Department's lead federal agency for NEOs. That's correct. General McKenzie? I, I agree with that. And it's the State Department un responsible under law, again, for requesting the emergency evacuation. Is that correct? That is correct, and, and I think actually, the, I think that's done at the ambassadorial level, to tell you the truth. Uh, I'd have to check the law, but I think the ambassador uh, can make the decision to execute a NEO, but typically it'll be to him or the Secretary of State. And did the State Department, specifically Embassy Kabul, have an evacuation plan for Afghanistan? So, Chairman, every, every embassy has an evacuation plan for Afghanistan. Uh, and Embassy Kabul had, had a plan, had what we would call an F-77 list, which is the list of U.S. Uh, citizens and their families that are in the country. Uh, and we uh, struggled to gain access to that plan and work with them over the, the months of July until we finally got a decision to execute the NEO, which, as I've already mentioned, occurred on the 14th of August. Now, we, we worked with the embassy before then, but we didn't have authority to move out and do the things that you have to do to make a NEO happen until the 14th of July, or correction, the 14th of August. And as I noted, we were in extremis at that point. And August 14th, just days before the fall of Kabul and the evacuation of the embassy, August 14th is when they finally put forward this plan? Now that's when we got authority to execute the plan. That's when you got authority to... And you urged the White House and State Department to put pen to paper 
to develop a plan to get Americans and our Afghan al allies out of Afghanistan, correct? Yes, I did. In fact, uh, I was concerned by the middle of July. I was concerned about the different pace of Department of Defense planning as compared to Department of State planning. And I took an opportunity then to make representations to the Secretary about my concern over that, the fact that we were moving pretty fast on this. Uh, they were not moving fast, and I was concerned that we were going to arrive at different locations just based on it. And, uh, and, and I rec rec went to the Secretary, we spent some time uh, talking about that and actually followed up with a written with a written idea on some things that we could do. Sent a letter with 10 recommendations to the Secretary of Defense on that. And is that your recollection, General Milley? Absolutely. The, um, you know, without breaching things like executive privilege, uh, et cetera, my assessments at the time, and Frank McKenzie submitted assessments, Scott Miller submitted assessments, the general consensus of the military, up through and including the Secretary of Defense, uh, was that the embassy should be coming out, uh, roughly speaking, at the same time we should be coming out. And then after the decisions were made to keep a diplomatic presence there, as the uh, situation deteriorated through the summer and the fall of the provincial capitals, et cetera, uh, we were clearly pressing for early calls to execute a NEO. And they did eventually develop a plan? Well, they, well, go ahead on the plan. So they, they had a plan. Uh, like, like I said, it's a requirement to have the plan, but it's one thing to have the plan. It's the second thing to do the actual coordination on the plan to talk about the specifics of execution. So having a plan is one thing, preparing the plan, vetting the plan, coordinating the plan with the people that are going to actually carry you out, the Department of Defense, that's another set of tasks completely. And that was too little, too late. It was my judgment that it was far too little, far too late. Was that your assessment, General Milley? It was, and, and I would broaden it a little bit by saying it was a pretty consistent assessment by me and other members of the uniformed military, up to and including the Secretary, uh, that the withdrawal of the military forces uh, and the contractors in the NATO forces that went with it would ultimately lead, as I said in my opening statement, uh, to a general collapse of the ANSF and the government. Um, and as I mentioned, the tension was, you know, when would those conditions be made? It was also our assessment um, at the time that keeping an embassy open in a war zone, which Afghanistan was, uh, and to do that without the presence of the U.S. military and the contractors in NATO, et cetera, that that embassy would be untenable. And that was your advice to the State Department and the White House? Well, as you know, because of the requirements of executive privilege, et cetera, I can tell you what my assessments were at the time, and those were my thoughts at the time. Do you believe you know that their uh, failure to plan timely created the chaos at HKIA Airport? I think the call to execute the NEO came too late. Um, and as uh, General McKenzie mentioned, it was officially logged in on the 14th. At that point in time, the Afghan government senior leadership was preparing to depart, and they departed the next day on the 15th. Uh, the uh, thousands of Afghan civilians were gathering at the airport. Uh, the Afghan security forces were collapsing in the various provincial capitals, and, and, and although there were some still in and around uh, Kabul. So the general situation at that point was 750 U.S. soldiers in and around the embassy. The Turkish troops were required, uh, along with some ANSF, to protect uh, HKIA. They melted away. So you had a situation with the U.S. embassy and 750 troops uh, when that NEO was called. And that's – and now, we had leaned forward, so I think it's the ninth, 10th, or 11th time frame we had already put forces on alert, et cetera. But in essence, we alerted, marshaled, deployed 82nd Airborne Division, Division Ready Brigade, and the uh, MU uh, out of Saudi under, that was underneath General McKenzie's control. They rapidly deployed along with special forces uh, to take control of that airport. Uh, it took a two, two to three days. That's where those videos come from. Uh, but they eventually wrested control of that airport. And, and General McKenzie, you agree with that assessment? I do. That reflects the opinion I had at the time and the, and the opinion I had now. Yeah, I believe the accountability ensures mistakes of the past are not repeated. But from where I sit, the president and this administration refuse to acknowledge their failures. There's an inscription at the National Archives down the street that reads, what is past is prologue. Now, I launched this investigation to make sure that the mistakes made in Afghanistan never, ever happen again. With that, I recognize the ranking member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me start 
by saying thank you. You all volunteer. You you're here voluntarily. Is that correct? Correct. That is correct, sir. Although you did receive the threat of a subpoena at one point. Is that also correct? Received a threat of being subpoenaed to come today. Um, Chairman McCall mentioned that it, he wanted us to appear and that there are compulsory measures, which I took to mean subpoena, sure. Uh, but uh, look, at that wasn't necessary from the beginning. I know you came yeah. voluntarily, but I just want to get the point out that there was something in regards to, uh, you know, a subpoena to come, correct? I was not subpoenaed. I said the threat of a subpoena to come. Um, or uh, something compulsory. Let me answer it like this. Uh, when I, before I retired, um, I, I testified several times as well as uh, General McKenzie uh, in open and classified hearings on Afghanistan. Um, prior to retirement, Chairman McCall asked me, would you be willing to discuss with the committee? I said, absolutely, yes. No threat of subpoena, no compulsory, nothing. I said, yes. I saw Chairman McCall again after retirement, uh, and he reminded me of that conversation. I said, sure, absolutely. So in January and February of this year, we worked out uh, you know, some of the details. I said I wanted to go back and review records, et cetera. Uh, and then it was originally supposed to be a closed classified hearing, because I, and I still think we're going to do one of those after this. And I thought that was important to be a classified hearing, because a lot of information is still classified. Uh, and then there was this discussion of a public hearing. I, and, you know, so just speaking of that, um, When you test before, you've testified before, you've testified before the Armed Services Committee, is that correct? Testified before the House and Senate Armed Services Committees in both classified and open hearings, and then have testified about Afghanistan and several other testimonies that weren't specific Same with you, to right, General McKenzie? That's correct. Okay. And is your testimony, has anything changed from when you were in uniform and testifying to what you've testified today? Has there anything that uh, you, uh, you know, didn't testify to before that you're testifying to now? Is there any change of, your, of thought of what took place today from what you testified to previously? In general, for me, everything that I testified before is still true and accurate today. And um, in, in open testimony, that, that would be correct. I have learned more from about Abby Gate because of the investigations that wasn't available during previous testimonies. For me, it wasn't. Uh, but I have since read those investigations and been briefed on them, but they weren't available the first time. So your testimony today is still basically consistent and transparent Very cons to your yes, testimony? Totally consistent. General McKenzie? That's the same for me. Uh, right. So there's not really anything new that was learned today uh, because you've testified to it before, right? I'll, I'll leave that to you all to determine if there's anything new. Well, I'm just I've asking you before. from your testimony and from what you, you know, what has been made public and what has been public. Sure. It's basically, this is not something well, new. So, ranking member, as I mentioned in my opening statement, much of what I say today is going to mirror the 10 hours that's, of that's testimony my point, I gave that earlier. This is not anything groundbreaking or anything that, uh, you know, is being discovered newly. This is something that has been out in the public from the time that you testified back in uh, 2022, 2022, right? Nothing groundbreaking here. Fact of the matter is, uh, let me ask this question. Um, I think maybe it was you, General Milley, said that uh, the framework for what took place during the 20 years, because I think that we should be looking at, if we really want to figure out what went wrong, what we need to fix, we need to look at the entire 20 years of being in Afghanistan, not just the last few months. Would you say that's correct? Yes, and I said that before as well in previous testimony. Now, in the written remarks that I'm submitting for the record, I've elaborated on what I think are, say, top 10 lessons learned, but there's many more. Um, you, you're not going to learn all the lessons of a 20-year war in short sessions, but I think there's a, a huge amount of lessons to be learned over the course of 20 years. You know, should we have gone after bin Laden in 2001 in that winter when we had, uh, we had him more or less from an intel standpoint we thought we had them uh, located. Uh, should we? Could we have? Yes. Should we have? I think yes. In hindsight, that would have changed the trajectory of the whole war. Uh, and there's a whole series of lessons along the way. Specific to this hearing and to help these families, 
I think the focus is more recent relative to the withdrawal itself and the Abbey Gate and the Neo. Uh, but you're correct. A holistic view, absolutely, I think. And that, but that's going to take a considerable amount of time. Would you that. say that the Doha agreement that was done under the Trump, uh, the Trump administration had some connection to the conditions on the ground when Joe Biden became president and leading on yeah. up into uh, sure. uh, to what took a place at Abbey Gate? There was, some, there was a, a nexus there. Is that not correct? Yeah, I think that the, the end game, if you will, the final you know, months, I think the, the uh, framework of that is set by the Doha Agreement, absolutely. So if we're going to study to find out the findings of what we should do, we should be talking about what happened during the Trump administration as well as what took place during the Biden administration because they are connected. They're not separate. And so if we're serious about trying to figure out what took place and why it took place, we should be looking at both what took place under the Bush administration, the Obama administration, the Trump administration, and is that not correct? Sure. I've, I've, as you point out, four presidents. I think there's half a dozen secretaries of defense, half a dozen secretaries of state. There's half a dozen chairmen of Joint Chiefs of Staff. There's another four commanders in Afghanistan. So yes, th there's absolutely lessons to be learned through all of this. And th the end game, using the DAR agreement, if you wanted to say that was the start point, uh, sure, there's, there's a lot to be said about that as well. And there is a continuum. As I mentioned in my opening statement, there's no phenomenon but, but like my, the end of a war. That my point is, is this. Yeah. If we're taking a serious look at this, sure. you can't just take a peek at one little segment of it and say this is the reason everything happened without looking at what preceded it because you'd have to look at it in its entirety. Isn't that correct? If you're serious about trying to figure out how we're going to make sure the mistakes that may have made and the things that we did right, you can only do that in a serious investigation if you take all of it and you look at all of it and you examine all of it, not just piecemealing that. Would you agree with that? Of course. I mean, I, I said that in my opening <laughs> statement. I said in previous testimony that a holistic look at the whole war in order to really determine outcomes, et cetera. And anything as complex as a war uh, is not the result of a single causal factor. There's multiple you factors and multiple decisions. So yes, in general, I agree. Uh, I but I'm here for these families to try to get them answers uh, and to try to get answers on the immediate issues that are at hand. So I know, I mean, I know so the chairman went, so I just want to do the same amount of time that he had. I don't want to get cut off there. Um, um, so let me, let me ask this. With the conclusion of the Doha deal, the Taliban stopped attacking U.S. forces inside Afghanistan. Is that correct? They, well, yes, lethal attacks. They weren't they committed to not doing that. There were some attacks, but they committed to not conducting lethal attacks. And by my memory, I don't think there was a lethal attack on U.S. forces. Uh, uh, so let me ask this, because we're running out of time. I, know, I saw the chairman finished sure. about with five minutes there. So and the United, when the United States committed to the Doha deal, that was to withdraw, and I quote, withdraw from Afghanistan all military forces of the United States its allies, coalition partners, including all non-diplomatic civilian personnel, private security contractors, trainers, advisors, and supporting service personnel. Is that correct? That was the Doha deal done under the Trump administration. Is that correct? As I recall, I think there were seven conditions that the United States signed up to and eight conditions that the Taliban signed up to. And I think you rattled off most of the key ones. It was a very explicit thing. It said you had to go from the, the there were 13,000 more or less, 13,000 U.S. troops uh, when Doha was signed, and then it was, you had to go to 8,600 in 135 days. Let, let, let me just do this. This I want to make sure. And so therefore, the withdrawal was well underway in January 2021 after President Trump withdrew U.S. forces, notwithstanding concerns about the Taliban's behavior. Is that correct? The withdrawal was absolutely underway. The drawdown of forces was underway, that's correct. So I don't have time, but I would like, you know, because I would like to do a complete investigation. That is what I think that our committee is, has the responsibility so that we can really be transparent with the American people on everything that took place in the 20 years in Afghanistan. Not just one piece, mm -hmm. but everything. If we are serious and not playing politics with this issue. 
deal back. Jim's time has expired. I will say the Afghanistan Commission has been commissioned to look at the last 20 years. The purpose of this investigation is to examine the evacuation. I will hold the members accountable at five minutes okay. under the rules discipline so we, that we can get to every member on this committee who deserves to be heard. And we thank you for showing up. And with that, I recognize Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> thank you for calling this important hearing. Thank you to the two generals for your distinguished service to our country. Thank you so very much for that. You know, uh, General uh, Milley, you, you mentioned how you had suggested a minimum of 2,500 troops to remain. Uh, who rejected your advice? Was it the president? Uh, do you, did you ever get a written or oral uh, uh, feedback as to why they rejected that advice? Well, again, I, I can't say, you know, the president said this, the president said that. that. That's beyond the scope of the law, actually, with executive privilege. But it's obvious that the president made the decision, and the president made an announcement on the 14th. Uh, and our recommendation was, as I mentioned, or our thoughts at the time was, as I mentioned. And every president has a right to make those decisions. He's looking at things from a much wider angle uh, than, than a military angle. Our military assessment was keep 2,500. And with them, it's not just 2,500. It's 2,500 plus the NATO plus the contractors. Right. And the contractors are key here. Um, and then that, we thought, our assessment was, that would keep the Afghan government, the military, <clears throat> stable until such time as a diplomatic outcome could occur uh, in accordance with the conditions set in the Doha Agreement. In retrospect, would that have made the difference? I mean, we'll never know, I guess, because it didn't happen. So I, I do think, though, that um, I, I believe that the Afghan government, the Afghan security forces would not have collapsed in August of 21. Had we maintained that posture, those were high-end special forces capable of uh, defending themselves and, and conducting operations as they had been for a while. And, and I think my assessment, probably moderate to significant risk on U.S. forces, uh, but is that worth that risk? Uh, again, the Doha, had, the Doha agreement had conditions, but here was the problem for two presidents. <clears throat> nobody that I recall, nobody, zero, could con coherently argue how it would end or how those conditions, the diplomatic conditions, were going to be obtained. Understood. Not a military problem, but how are those diplomatic conditions going to be obtained? Give me something to ask you. I asked Secretary of State Blinken uh, on September of 2021 about the infamous phone call with Ghani, uh, and Reuters did get a copy of that phone call about the transcript and apparently an actual verbatim. They listened to it. And, and in it he said uh, that... There's a need, whether it's true or not, this is this, our President of the United States saying this, whether it's true or not, there's a need to project a different picture about the Taliban's capabilities. Uh, General McKenzie, you talked about how there was no plan to get U.S. citizens out. And then there seemed to be a bewilderment on the part of the administration why Americans weren't flocking to leave. They didn't have many ways of doing it anyway. Uh, and I'm just wondering what you thought of that phone call. I mean, I asked Blinken, he said, you know, I don't talk about something that's been leaked. Well, is it true? Did he say that? You know, lying like that to me, uh, when you give the false impression uh, to a whole group of Americans who never then got out, uh, that's very, very serious. Secondly, just let me ask, because I will run out of time, how many Americans um, were left behind uh, and again, I thank you that you did everything you could to make this policy work, but you were given a, a policy that was egregiously flawed. But how many Americans are left behind? How many of our, of our allies? And what has happened to them? Have they been beaten, killed, uh, tortured? And secondly, about all the weapons that were left behind, uh, there are reports that some of it has found its way to Hamas. I don't know if that's true. Uh, I know you did everything you could on the way out to destroy them, but many were intact and left in the hands of the Taliban. I can't speak to the phone call. Uh, I don't have any personal knowledge of that. Um, number of Americans. Uh, that, this was always an issue. Uh, uh, the number of Americans, as General McKenzie said, an F-77 report is supposed to, every ambassador in every country of the world keeps an F-77 report, and they're supposed to track the, the Americans, where they're at, the phone numbers, address, et cetera, in the country. That was always a difficult number for us in the Department of Defense to get a hold of, and I think it's true at the tactical level as, and operational level as well. Uh, and I'll be candid. I don't know the exact number of Americans that were left behind because the starting number was never clear. Same is true of at-risk Afghans, SIVs, uh, the commandos, other Afghans that serve with us. Uh, those numbers uh, varied so widely that they were quite inaccurate. 
uh, as, as best I could uh, tell at the time. Uh, so um, I, I would just say I'm not sure, even today, about the accuracy of all those numbers. Are they in jail, dead, some of them? I think some were killed. Uh, Afghans, I don't know about the Americans. I don't think the Americans were, but I think uh, some of the Afghans were tracked down that worked with us, and I think some of them were uh, killed, in, and I'm pretty certain some of them in pretty brutal ways. Some were managed to escape through various means. Uh, others have just laid low and keeping their heads down. Gentlemen's time's expired. Uh, Chair recognizes Mr. Sherman. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I wish we were having a hearing with these excellent witnesses on what's on people's minds, uh, which is what's going on in Gaza, where we could discuss the incredible difficulties of urban warfare and how the top expert on urban warfare at uh, West Point has said that Israel has done a, at least as good a job as any other military in minimizing civilian casualties given the incredible difficulties of urban warfare. Instead, we have what appear a highly politicized hearing trying to blame uh, Biden. And this hearing began with the title, Biden's Strategic Failure. I, it's my understanding that our witnesses refused to testify with that title. Uh, in any case, they should have. We've now retitled the hearing, but we haven't repurposed it. It re continues to be politicized. But a highly partisan hearing shouldn't be held if you're in the party that made most of the mistakes. Uh, let us, we had, uh, let's put this in context. We had uh, a real dispute as to whether we should leave 2,500 or so American uh, servicemen there for perhaps this decade and the following decade. Uh, the dissent cable argued for that. A lot of the foreign policy establishment argued for that. But Trump promised the American people every single American soldier would be out. And from that point, we had no bargaining position. That's why uh, Khaliza, uh, Khali, the uh, chief negotiator, uh, said that it was well known by 2018, by the end of 2018, that we are hell-bent to get every uh, person out. And so what kind of agreement did we enter into in Doha, supposedly by the best negotiator in the world, then President Trump? It is an agreement that says it's okay for the Taliban to treat 12-year-old girls like sex slaves. No provision prohibits that. Nothing prohibits the Taliban from killing people because they're part of the LGBT community. Nothing prohibits them from killing someone because they convert from Islam to Christianity. All they're required to do is talk to the Afghan government. They talked, perhaps, and then they assumed total power. And we could do nothing about it because we had promised the American people that absolutely every soldier would be out. And of course, right before the election, Trump promised to have them all back by Christmas of 2020. Um, the Trump administration lost 59 of our servicemen, 152 of our contractors, accomplishing absolutely nothing. We surrendered in 2020. We could have surrendered in 2017. Uh, but perhaps uh, the most extreme partisanship has arised when so many members of this committee have attacked President Biden supposedly for not bringing back the, quote, 85 billion, I think it's closer to $8 billion, of equipment that we left behind. Now, this equipment was in the hands of Afghans who had uh, plenty of use for it. They could keep it for their own defense. They could sell it to the Taliban. They did not choose to bring it back to us and return it. Um, so I'll ask uh, 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 General Milley, uh, had we, was there a way for us to go all around Afghanistan and demand the return of our equipment this is assuming, I, I realize that at the time we hoped that the Afghan armed forces would use that to resist the Taliban. But if we had realized that they were going to cave immediately, could we have taken that equipment away from all these Afghans with no casualties? No, of course not. So, so we would have incurred very substantial casualties if we had done what so many on the other side of the aisle have uh, suggested, and that somehow get back our equipment. Now, how does our um, 
withdrawal from Afghanistan compare to our withdrawal uh, from, uh, well, actually, I have another question. Biden came in in uh, January 2020. One, was there a comprehensive plan at that time to both withdraw absolutely every one of our servicemen, because that was the promise Trump had made to the American people, while uh, withdrawing in an organized way with no American casualties? Was there a complete plan ready to go at that time? So two points. If I go back to the equipment just very quickly, um, as I recall, and I think it's laid out in the SEGARS report, the uh, special uh, IG for Afghanistan, there's about 80-some-odd uh, billion dollars worth of military aid total. That's everything from food and building barracks and uniforms and boots to include equipment uh, over 20 years. Right. And then he cites, I think it's 7.2 billion of military equipment, U.S. manufactured military equipment, that is with the Afghan security forces. That's Afghan-owned equipment, not American equipment. Every piece of American equipment that the American military owned came out with us with Scott Miller or he destroyed it on site. And that's a fact. So uh, the idea that the Americans So, so this, uh, this attack on Biden for not the, uh, taking the equipment back is, is total uh, to recognizes Mr. Wilson, South Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I ask for unanimous consent to submit two reports from the George W. Bush Institute of February 2024, the captured state on human cost and on uh, corruption. Objection so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And indeed, generals, we, we appreciate your service. And, uh, but we just have to learn from uh, what's occurred, the appeasement uh, in Afghanistan. The Biden decision to appease is the worst foreign policy national security decision, I believe, in the history of the United States. It led directly to the encouragement of dictators who are ruling by gun to invade the democracies of rule of law. We saw that on February 22, 2022 when war criminal Putin invaded Ukraine. We saw that on October 7, 2023, when the regime in Tehran, through their puppets of Hamas, invaded uh, Israel. We see it today as the world's largest military buildup is being conducted by the Chinese Communist Party to threaten Taiwan. The global war on terrorism continues, and indeed with open borders, the American families have never been at greater risk of attack. And I especially appreciate uh, the military families who are here today, uh, as a 31-year veteran of the 218th Infantry Brigade, I visited four times with our personnel, uh, with the Adjutant General Bob Livingston, our troops serving in Afghanistan, and I saw them serve with their Afghan brothers, just as you, just as you did. And due to encouragement by my wife, I'm particularly grateful my oldest son, Alan, received a CAB in uh, Iraq, my second son, a doctor at Baghdad, International Airport, my third, uh, served at the southern border and also served in uh, Egypt. And my youngest son served uh, under your command a year uh, in Afghanistan. And to me, uh, the Biden decision uh, that led to the 13 deaths of the uh, persons at Abbey Gate, the service members, is just inexcusable. And I actually felt uh, assured, generals, knowing that uh, your competence and capability, particularly a Citadel graduate, uh, but I am very concerned that uh, you were blamed on uh, August the 26th, 2021, by Mr. Biden. He specifically said that the 13 murder, the uh, withdrawal of uh, forces, was uh, a decision uh, as determined by the military. And he said he had letters that indicated that um, you had said that uh, there should be a, a, an immediate appeasement. Uh, I sent a letter that day to the president asking for copies of the letters. And uh, every couple of months, I'll send copy, uh, another request. It has not been provided. And so uh, there are no letters. And uh, it's the responsibility of the president of the United States, his decision uh, that resulted in uh, what occurred of uh, putting American families at risk. With that, and indeed, the Doha agreement, uh, each of you, uh, was there, uh, a violation. It was conditions-based. And weren't, uh, were there violations by uh, the Taliban of the agreement? I'll let John McKenzie give the specifics. But yes, the Taliban violated every condition of the agreement except lethal attacks on US forces from the time they signed the agreement all the way to the end. Uh, so uh, yes, they were in violation. They, they didn't renounce al-Qaeda. Uh, they didn't do Afghan to Afghan negotiations. 
uh, they didn't, uh, there's a whole series of conditions in the DAW agreement that they didn't do. No, that's correct. Every, every, every condition except the, the, one, the one narrow condition about attacks on U.S. and coalition forces. Uh, and in particular, actually, they stepped up intensely attacks on Afghan forces during this period because we had agreed to actually withdraw substantive air combat support from the Afghan military during this period of time, and they took advantage of that opportunity. And, and I appreciate that uh, President Donald Trump has indicated it was conditions-based. The conditions were violated, uh, and that would have led uh, to his view of maintaining the uh, Bagram base. What is your position? So my, my position on Bagram was it linked to my recommendation, my position then and now, that we should have held at 2,500. At 2,500 U.S. forces, if you also assume that will allow the Afghans to stay in the fight, you can maintain a viable base at Bagram. And, and, I and indeed, Bagram, Bagram would be critical. protecting American families. And hey, as we conclude, uh, we still have a president making bad decisions. And that is that we had seven weeks ago, uh, three young Americans were killed, uh, Army reservists from Georgia. And this was a decision of the president, Mr. Biden, who did not follow through on trying to stop these attacks on our troops uh, by the puppets of uh, Iran. And uh, we've lost three service members, over 40 injured. And the president needs to take this seriously. We're in a conflict for as existential of our country. Thank you. The gentleman yields. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Crow. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Chairman Milley and General McKenzie for your service then and for coming voluntarily to testify and provide really important information to the committee and to the Gold Star families. And I join you in extending my condolences to the Gold Star families for um, making the ultimate sacrifice uh, a debt that certainly we can never repay, uh, but we are trying the best to, to get answers for you. And we also want to extend my condolences to the over 2,400 other Gold Star families who weren't able to join us here today, whose families also made the ultimate sacrifice over the 20 years of this war. Uh, my criticisms of the withdrawal, the missteps and the problems are well documented. There were certainly issues that, that have to be addressed, and I've been very clear about that. And I've, I've endeavored to get answers with my colleagues. Uh, but I also want to provide some really important context, and that is ending wars is never easy. And ending wars is never clean. And in fact, as you all know better than me, retrograde operations, withdrawal operations are some of the hardest uh, and most dangerous things that we ask our military to do. So I want to provide some of that context. Uh, Chairman Milley, you said in your opening that um, the Doha agreement that President Trump and his administration, administration entered into with the Taliban required the, the complete withdrawal of U.S. forces and diplomatic. Uh, that was the agreement that, that the Trump administration entered into. You said that uh, had we not complied with that agreement, that there would be, quote, open war with the Taliban, right? That they had uh, kept their agreement not to attack U.S. forces, which allowed us to withdraw and, and reduce our footprint. Um, so here today, had we not withdrawn and not ended the war, would be, we be at open war with the Taliban? I think the probability is uh, greater than not that the Taliban would have reinitiated combat operations on 1 May or 2 May. The Doha Agreement says all force out by 1 May. The uh, current administration that the State Department negotiated with the Taliban to get that extended, Zal Khalizay did, to get that extended until uh, September, I guess it was. Uh, to buy some additional time. But there's little question in my mind that had uh, the United States at, at either president's agreement to withdraw, if we didn't withdraw 100 percent, then uh, we would have been back at war with the Taliban. That's right. General McKenzie. I, I generally agree with uh, what, what General Milley said, but when we always thought about staying, keeping 2,500 beyond, we thought it needed to be needed to be coupled with an aggressive negotiation program with the Taliban, one that was perhaps had a few more sticks and not all carrots. So I think you needed to change your approach to negotiation if you decided to stay. You're, we'll never know. You'll never know. I, th I think I agree with General Milley. It's very possible that, that we could have been fighting the Taliban, but it's just that's just a counterfactual that, that we won't know the answer to. Okay. Thank you. On the issue of a NEO, I actually uh, was one of those voices that, that joined you and called for an earlier NEO. And that was something that I thought would have been better uh, and, and could have uh, led to a smoother evacuation, but not a, not a perfectly clean one, because NEOs are hard. And one thing I want to talk about is this issue of um, who we evacuate, right? You talked about getting uh, counts on US citizens, but the simple fact of the matter is the United States nowhere ever 
requires its citizens to register with the State Department. So in no instance do we ever fully know what Americans are on the ground in any situation. Is that correct? I think that's 100% correct, and you'll see it playing out today in Haiti. You saw it in the Sudan. You saw it in Ukraine. You saw it in many other places. Um, very, very difficult. It's a voluntary thing. People are encouraged to register with the embassy, but I don't know of any compulsory requirement to do that. And also, when we evacuate American citizens uh, in Afghanistan, many of those were, in fact, dual citizens. Is that accurate, General McKenzie? That's correct, yes. Uh, and, and many of those folks actually had non-American citizen family members. Is that right? That is correct. So many of them, not until the last moment, wanted to evacuate until they knew that there was a crisis because they didn't want to leave their family. Is that accurate? I think you are absolutely correct. So even, it, 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 even if we had started a NEO earlier, that doesn't mean at the end of the day there wouldn't have been a, a rush and a crisis as the Afghan government and security forces collapsed because people finally realizes, realized they needed to get out. That, that probably wouldn't have changed even if we had started the NEO earlier. Hard to know, but that's certainly a possibility. Last piece is uh, the part of the story that is not yet written, and that is our partners, our friends, our Afghan allies who are still there. Um, we have an obligation uh, uh, to get them out. Uh, there's a bill called the Afghan Allies Protection Act, a bipartisan bill. I'm going to thank uh, Mr. Baird over here, who's a co-sponsor of that. And I would encourage all my colleagues who are here who are not yet co-sponsors of that bill to sign on, uh, because we can still do right uh, and save lives by passing this bill and providing a pathway for our friends to get out. With that, I yield back. Yields, uh, Chair recognizes Mr. Perry from Pennsylvania. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, thank you for your service. Uh, uh, we honor the Gold Star families and the service members here today. General Milley, um, General McKenzie, was the ROE, was the re were the rules of engagement at the time of the Abbey Gate incident sufficient for service members like Tyler Vargas to protect themselves? So it's my judgment they were, and we went in with what we call the standard Chairman Joint Chiefs of Staff ROE with supplements for Afghanistan. There's three, three main components to it. First of all, the inherent right of self-defense. A U.S. service member anywhere in the world at any time has the right to defend him or herself against a threat. It does not have to be an action that you're defending against. It can be intent interpreted. So we were under that. We we're operating under that threat, under that ROE. At the same time, we had extended what we call collective self-defense to our friends, partners, and allies that are there. So you could take actions to defend the Brits. You could take actions to defend the, your Afghan partners. The third component of that was we used uh, what we call direct action authorities, which allowed you to strike people that were not in direct contact with you, particularly in relationship to Kabul if they posed a self-defense threat. So the last point I would say is we exercised self-defense with lethal effect three times during the defense of Kabul on 16, 20, and I believe 22 um, and 26 uh, August. Okay, so sticking with the Abbey Gate incident, uh, General McKenzie, you said there was no specific attack, attacker intelligence or no ex specific intelligence existed and that there was nobody on the BOLO uh, that fit that description. Does that remain true today? It does. So were you aware after the Abbey Gate attack, were you aware that service members at the gate had requested the ability to service the target, so to speak? Were you aware of that? No, I would not be aware and, of that. And it's understandable that a combatant commander might not be aware of what service members right on the line are aware of. But post that, that circumstance, were you concerned about the intelligence you were getting regarding the action you were about to take on the would-be attackers and that network. Sure, so on or about the 26th, we were tracking four broad, very active, very concerning threat streams. We were attacking, looking at the threat of a vehicle-borne right. IED, a person-born IED, which actually was the modality of the Abbey Gate attack. Right. We were looking at indirect fire, rockets and right. mortars, and we were looking at an, in, an, an insider attack, someone who gets in and blows himself up in the terminal. Right. So we had dozens of and but I you had nothing fitting the description of what your service members on the gate we on had the a line lot had of descriptions of men and and, uh, and and so when so when the service member on the line is looking at the attacker based on the description and and he's got the rules of engagement 
but the rules of engagement at that point require him to check with his commander, go up the line, and he, he, does, not get, he does not get approval. That, that's exceptionally concerning. I understand the fog of war. I get the circumstance you're in, but there's a man sitting here that's been blown up because he, could, he couldn't get the answer that he needed. So on Thursday, August 26th, the Ab Abbey Gate attack happens. Three days later, on August 29th, the drone strike occurs. Now, you said that we had up to six Reapers following this car around for eight hours, and that uh, I think up to 60 pieces of intelligence that proved that these were the people that had just attacked the Abbey Gate. Uh, not, no, sir, I, that's not correct. Well, that's what I've got here for open source reporting. Okay, maybe some of that's not correct, but regardless of the fact, on the 29th, the drone strike occurs, kills 10, seven of them children. Five days later, the Pentagon admits there was a mistake. Five days later. General Milley, when did you know that the drone strike was a failure? When did I know that the drone, drone strike, strike was a mistake? Drone strike on the civilian taking water with, to right. his family yeah. was a failure. No, I remember. The, uh, when did I know it? I probably... It was five days before the Pentagon said it was a mistake. When did you know? Probably day four, day five, in that range. I didn't know it right away, if that's what your question is. And who did you tell when you knew? Well, I think it came up through me to the Secretary of Defense. I don't and then again, the from exact... you to the SecDef? Well, it would have come from General McKenzie would have called me. I don't remember these specifics, but General McKenzie would have called me and said, we have an incident that... Does anybody upset. else in the, in the Biden administration know at that point that it's a failure? I honestly don't know. Because the whole time they're telling us secondary explosions, we got the target hey, lying to the right. American people, not having a clue. Who did you tell? I tell the Secretary of Defense. And of course, if we have a principal's meeting, we go through the details of the strike. But I guess I'm trying to, I, if, you're, if you're saying, did I tell the President of the United States or whomever, uh, other than the Secretary of Defense, that there was a mistake, I, th I think, and I'm doing this from memory, I think Frank McKenzie, General McKenzie, would have called me and I would have informed the Secretary of Defense, or he would have called the Secretary of Defense, which is his chain of command, and I might have been in there at the time. I don't recall the actual date time group, nor the individual that I mentioned to. But for several days, it was my impression that the procedures were executed correctly and that we struck a target that we thought was an enemy. There was a mistake made, it's a tragic, it's, it's huge, war. and we lied to the American people for five days and all these families we who were thought. lying, though, Congressman. I, lying implies we were intentionally trying to deceive. That is not what, I know that's not what I was doing. It's a pretty not, big mistake, sir. I yield the balance. Gentlemen, yields. Uh, I ask unanimous consent to allow Representative Miller Meeks of Iowa to sit on the dais and participate in today's hearing without objection. So the uh, chair now recognizes Mr. Schneider. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, General Milley, General McKenzie, uh, like my colleagues here, I want to thank you for your distinguished service to our nation. Uh, we're very grateful. I personally share your compassion and gratitude and extend my condolences to the Gold Star families here and all those who uh, lost loved ones, the more than 2,400 who made the ultimate sacrifice over the ne nearly 20 years of action in Afghanistan, as well as the thousands wounded, uh, both with uh, injuries that are visible and those that are not. Um, paraphrasing some of the things that I've heard today, um, you, no single factor determined the outcome is, I think, something you've, you've said. Um, 20 years of decisions, actions, successes, and failures all contributed to what uh, ultimately happened uh, in Afghanistan. Um, you said there was a whole series of lessons along the way. Uh, and if, if I come to something, General Milley, I think if I got it right, when you were talking with uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Ranking Member Meeks, that the start of the end was the Doha Agreement in 2020. Is that fair? I think that's a way that an historian could look at it. You could also start it in 2011 when there was a decision by the Obama administration to begin the drawdown. It's a 10-year process of drawdown. The end game itself, I would probably peg it at Doha because it's a continuum of un broken cause and effects from that moment to at the end. Yeah, I, I, I think that's fair. It's hard to put one point, but uh, what were your thoughts uh, at the, the time of, of the signing of the Doha Agreement in 2020? Well, uh, the military was not consulted on the Doha Agreement, nor would I necessarily expect to be, but 
Uh, that was a State Department operation that was done under Secretary of State Pompeo, which Al Calizade is the ambassador to do the negotiations. I was not consulted. It was an 18-month process, so it actually begins before I became the chairman. It begins under General Dunford. Uh, so that process goes on. I don't think, I don't know what General Dunford knew, but I don't think he knew much about it. We knew there was a negotiation going on, the specifics of which we were not, didn't know the terms of the negotiation. I found out about that from Secretary Esper uh, after the fact, uh, and, um, and then it was then, and then a week or two later, we found the, uh, we were given the uh, classified annex uh, to the Doha Agreement. Um, but no, we didn't participate in the development of the terms nor the negotiations. And when the decision was made to draw down to 2,500 uh, troops by, uh, I think you said, Inauguration Day, uh, did you see that as something that was sustainable get to the ultimate goal, or did that put uh, U.S. forces at undue risk? We ass my assessment at the time <clears throat> uh, was that 2,500 troop U.S. troops, and again, these are high-end Special Forces troops, uh, 2,500 U.S. troops with the contractors with NATO was the min force necessary in order to buy the time to ensure the conditions were going to get met and result in a nego satisfactory negotiated settlement uh, with, the, with the government of Afghanistan and the Taliban. Uh, uh, obviously, at, that didn't happen. But, uh, at, at any time between the Doha Agreement and uh, January of, tw of 21, when we were at 2,500 uh, or even April and ongoing, was the government involved in the negotiations? Was there evidence of progress being made in the negotiations between the Taliban and, and the government that would give confidence that we could achieve the conditions that, that were laid out in the, in the Doha Agreement? Um, I don't actually know that. Um, I think that's a, probably a question for the State Department because they would probably have better visibility. I don't think, I, I'm almost positive that there were no substantive negotiations between the government of Afghanistan, the government of you know, President Ghani, and the Taliban. Now, there may have been some back-channel stuff. There might have been some stuff that I'm not aware of, but I am not aware of substantive negotiations between the government of Afghanistan. And in fact, the Doha Agreement, that's one of the um, uh, requirements, one of the conditions is that uh, there, one of the conditions is a reduction in violence for a specified period of time. I think it was 90 days, if I remember. And then that was supposed to lead to a permanent countrywide ceasefire. And then that would lead to a negotiated settlement between the government of Afghanistan and the Taliban. Uh, obviously, the Taliban didn't adhere to those conditions. They blew through those, uh, but that was part of the Doha Agreement. And that, I think, and I know you had Dr. Kalazite here before, I think that's kind of what he was trying to make happen, but it never happened. I understand. I'm, I'm almost out of time, but, uh, you know, the goal was to have that negotiated agreement. The Taliban quickly, I think, recognized that they didn't need to negotiate with the government. The government was weak, and, and they could achieve their goals by, by other means. Uh, at what point, if any, and this is to both of you, uh, would you mark the tipping point where the outcome was all but certain? Uh, it was probably long before uh, uh, August of 2021, I imagine. I, I would say two points. Uh, one is the Doha Agreement, because it was negotiated between the government of the United States and a State Department designated terrorist organization, the Taliban, and it was a bilateral agreement, that kind of pulled the rug out morale-wise from both the Afghan security forces and the government itself, because at that point they knew with certainty that there was a date certain now. Right. Uh, so I think that probably had a significant effect. We'll have to, historians are going to have to figure out exactly what that effect is. Uh, the actual observable tipping point of the collapse of the Afghan military, et cetera, that clearly is in July. Uh, as you start looking at uh, when, uh, when uh, uh, provincial capitals start falling, the first provincial capital falls, I think it's 6 August, uh, and then in the next 10 days, the rest of them start falling all the way to the capture Kabul. Uh, but it's at the, the end of July, sort of right at the beginning of August, it, it becomes evident that the Afghan security forces are crumbling, uh, and we're, we are in it, and that's where the whole Neil thing comes up. Thank but you. But that's, that's, uh, that's about the timing. All right, Chairman McCall, thank you for the expired. extra time. Uh, the chair recognizes Mr. Wagner. I uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank our witnesses for their time and their, their service to our country, recognizing certainly our Gold Star families that have joined us and those that have not uh, today. One of the 13 lost at Abbeygate uh, was from my community in Missouri, uh, Lance Corporal Jared Schmitz. And I also want to remind our, our viewers and our colleagues here today that the title of this hearing, of this particular hearing, is an assessment of the Biden administration's withdrawal 
from Afghanistan by America's generals. Even today, two and a half years after the Biden administration's botched withdrawal, after countless hearings, roundtables, and briefings, the incompetence that led to the abandonment of Afghanistan absolutely astounds me. The administration ignored the advice of allies, experts, and military leaders, blowing past warning sign after warning sign as it allowed Afghanistan to collapse. The total betrayal of our US military servicemen and women, of our allies um, of Afghanistan, and the subsequent chaotic, shameful withdrawal has seriously damaged our credibility uh, as an ally and a leader. And because of the Biden administration's actions, American communities are less safe and the world is much more dangerous and unstable. We are paying the price now with conflicts roiling every corner of the globe. And yes, General Milley, those responsible must provide answers, um, as you've said over and over, but also they must be held to account. General Milley, General McKenzie, I ask the following questions, not just as a member of Congress, but also as a mother of an Army Ranger who served uh, under your command in combat in Afghanistan. So let me ask both of you, General Milley, General McKenzie, did you engage with our NATO allies and other allied nations about the withdrawal plan before President Biden announced his decision to go to zero in April 2021? Absolutely, sure. That was fundamental. And then the NATO slogan at the time was in together, out together. So we coordinated multiple times with our NATO allies. Did our, did our allies with troops in Afghanistan recommend not going to zero prior to or after President Biden's April 2021 withdrawal announcement? John McKenzie? Uh, yes, they did. And it was my actual belief that had we stayed at 2,500, we would have had probably 5,000. Yours NATO and everyone forces. else's. And maybe, more, maybe more than that. Including the Trump administration. Did our allies with troops in Afghanistan inform you that they would withdraw if the U.S. went to zero? General Milley? Yes, they, they said, uh, we'll be aligned with you, in together, out together, we'll be aligned with you, and, and that they would follow our lead. General McKenzie? Yes, because of the unique capabilities that the United States brings, they couldn't have stayed without our presence. General Milley and General McKenzie, with the withdrawal of U.S. forces from Afghanistan was nearly uh, complete by mid-July, more than a month ahead of the August deadline. <clears throat> Why was the drawdown ex uh, executed so quickly? And did you at any point believe the process was moving too fast? I'll, I'll, I'll take that. So it was by design. From the very beginning, we wanted to get out as quickly as we could because we believe speed brought safety. And it would also give us a cushion in case unanticipated problems arose. what objectives, arose. threat assessments, or orders were driving the speed? Uh, concerns about the Taliban attacking us, concerns about ISIS being able to carry out attacks, and, but also a desire to have room at the back end in case we had trouble, we had weather problems, we had aircraft problems that, that slowed us down in, in, in case that did not happen. It's, now, was, it's now clear, sir, that the Afghan military and some of our allies, for that matter, were not ready for how quickly the U.S. Uh, withdrawal occurred. Did you ever consider or advise that the pace of the drawdown slowed to ensure the Afghan military was able to successfully transition? Um, if so, why was such action not taken? So the Afghan military was read in from the beginning about the pace of the withdrawal. And frankly, ma'am, I don't believe that waiting another 30 days would have had any material impact at all. One, on the one Afghan quick other question, ability. and I thank you so much. General Milley, General McKenzie, has the Taliban been carrying out a campaign of retribution? reprisals, and revenge killings against the Afghan allies that we left behind? I believe, yes. Absolutely. Systematically. Systematically. I yield back. General A. Yields. Chair recognizes Mr. Phillips. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Milley, General McKenzie, thank you for your sacrifices. To my colleagues on both sides of the aisle who have served in uniform, thank you for yours. To all of you in this room who might have served, um, I'm grateful. 
and particularly to the Gold Star families uh, in the room. Uh, if you might just raise your hands, those of you here are representing loved ones. Okay. I'm one of you, and thank you for holding that up. Um, I'm one of you, and I know how you feel. I've been looking for answers my whole life after having lost my father in Vietnam. You can imagine the questions I have to this very day. Uh, with the help of Chairman Milley's office and the chairman himself, uh, I was able to go back to Vietnam for the first time in my life in March of last year. I went to the very dirt, the very dirt where my father took his last breath. And I can tell you from that experience, it is where I took my first. And when I came home, I recognized two things. First of all, one of the answers is this little piece of plastic. It's the voting card that we use in the House chamber in the Capitol. It's where we make decisions that can make life and also take life. It's true in the White House. It's true with uh, our generals. It's true with our armed services. And um, the weight of that is something that changed me forever. But what I also recognized is how remarkable the hospitality of the Vietnamese were when I was there. Uh, the People's Army, uh, our own people in Vietnam, how gracious, how hospitable, how kind, how caring, and how meaningful they saw my return. And my question to you, General, both generals, is this. What do we need to start doing today, today, in Afghanistan, to ensure that families here and families of the 2,400 others that lost their lives can one day return to Afghanistan and have that same blessing that I had to visit the dirt where my father was killed? I'll be candid, um, Congressman. I don't think there's anything immediate. Um, it will take years upon years upon years. Uh, in my view, this personal view, I believe the Taliban is still a terrorist organization. I still believe that they conduct incredible, horrific retribution inside their own country. And I would not recommend uh, to any family member at this time to return. There is probably some diplomatic initiatives that could be done in the years ahead. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the Taliban, and that's my question, sir, is, is you know, my return was 54 years later. Exactly. What do we need to do now, It'll be 10, 20, 30 years, to plant the seeds so that people can return? I have a, look at, I've served several tours in Afghanistan, a lot of, lost a lot of people, yeah. uh, to include these 13, and I have a problem reconciling with the Taliban. My father had a problem reconciling with the Japanese. Mm -hmm. Wars are horrible, terrible things, and... Uh, I'm carrying that with me, and I'll probably go to the grave with it. Uh, so I don't know how, long, how many years it's going to take, but it's going to take a long time. I appreciate it. General McKenzie, any thoughts on what we need to do, this institution, members of Congress, the White House, what do we need to do now? Well, I think, Frank, or 50 years from now, others can go back. Frankly, our principal concern with Afghanistan right now should be the fact that al-Qaeda and ISIS have the opportunity to gather strength in ungoverned spaces with clear desire to attack our homeland. So I think we should begin with concern about that. And Let's I, talk about that. What should we be doing on that account? <clears throat> it's more difficult now than it was before, obviously. What should we be doing now? <clears throat> So I think we need to continue to resource U.S. Central Command so they have the opportunity to do surveillance into Afghanistan. I'm, I'm out of that picture now. I don't Understand. know what they do, but I think we need to keep an eye on it. Uh, I think that's very important. In the long term, I believe it is decades away mm -hmm. before there's going to be any rapprochement with Afghanistan, particularly given their, their unusually and specifically horrific treatment of women, children, human rights issues, and they seem to embrace that. I agree with the chairman that the Taliban is a terrorist organization. They themselves don't have a desire to attack us in our homeland, but they do harbor entities and organizations that do have a desire to do that. And I think right now it's hard for me to get beyond that relentless focus. I understand, but I have about 50 seconds left. The U.S. has a history of making war, sometimes successfully, sometimes not. Uh, we also have a tradition of making peace, sometimes successfully, sometimes not. But looking to success and prospectively, uh, we've made a lot of our former enemies our dear friends and, and allies. Are there things that we should be thinking about right now as it relates to making former enemies our friends? Well, the case of Afghanistan, it's hard to find common ground with them Understood. right now. And that it's seems difficult. to be the theme, and it I It is and difficult I for it. me to, I'm, I'm probably not the right person to ask. Right. You might ask uh, someone from the Department of State I understand. Uh, to come in and talk to you more about that, or USAID, because there are some opportunities there. I get but it. from my, my perspective, I tend to focus on the security issues, okay. and frankly, sir, the security issues are profound. I get it. Well, gentlemen, thank you, and to the Gold Star families, rest assured, my mission now is to ensure someday you can go back, because uh, there's nothing more meaningful and powerful. God bless you all. Thank you. I yield back. Gentlemen, yields. Chair now recognizes a veteran of Afghanistan who 
uh, made dear sacrifices to his nation and to Afghanistan as well, Mr. Mast. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Generals, for your attendance and for your answers today and for putting on a uniform in defense of this country. I think any of us that put on a uniform want the next generation to wake up every day and be able to say this country's still worth it. America is worth the fight. And it's, it's one of the most important reasons that we have these hearings and that we do these oversights so that everybody can wake up and say, yeah, this is a place that, that's worth it. I wanna ask some questions about targeting. Uh, I've watched your all's interviews uh, from in uniform to, to leaving uniform. Uh, as you can imagine, it's of great personal interest to me and of course to the Gold Star families as well throughout the war. We left on August 30th, 2021. Uh, we lost 13 service members on the 26th of 2021, and moving behind those dates, can you recall when the last time it was that America targeted somebody specifically for the purpose of termination uh, on the 25th, on the 24th, on the 23rd, wherever, whether it be ISIS-K, whether it be Taliban, whether it be Al-Qaeda? Sure, on the night of 27, 28 August, we, ta we targeted an ISIS-K bomb maker in Nangarhar province. Took prior to the 26th, General. Oh, I know that we, we uh, made a mistaken target. Uh, that, that was that the 29th. That was two days later. Prior to the 26th, prior to the Abbey Gate. We had, it, it had been quite a while before we, had, before we had actually struck any deep targets. It had been a lengthy period of time. I couldn't give the exact date, but it was probably a matter of many weeks since many we weeks. had struck a target that you would, you would develop and strike as a personality target or a deep strike target. Our strikes were during the period, particularly after the Doha Agreement, we were more in direct self-defense of Afghan forces, and that became increasingly difficult to deliver as our aircraft were repositioned out of Afghanistan as we drew down. So our strikes became increasingly limited. Now, the Afghans struck, and they struck not only close defense targets, but deep targets, but we had very limited visibility on those targets, and I do not believe they were necessarily effective in those strikes. And I want to get to that a little bit, General McKenzie. Uh, and one of your interviews uh, was with Fox, and you said this specifically, there were a wide variety of targets the U.S. military told the Taliban to look at. And it's that that I really want to get specifically to. When did that envelope change for America and, and what did it look like? Which targets were we choosing to give to the Taliban to target and which targets were we keeping for ourselves? What met that threshold of saying the U.S. is going to hit this, but we're going to give this off to the, to the Talibs? Sure, so I'd prefer to talk a little bit more about this in the closed session, but we passed the Taliban information on targets that were in close proximity to, to Kaya, places where we thought ISIS-K was gathering, ISIS-K might uh, be preparing to strike, and there were about 18 of those targets that we passed. Uh, and they took action on some of them. I can't tell you if they took action on all of them because we didn't have visibility on them. Now, when I say they actioned them, they didn't strike them with a drone, obviously. They drove out, looked at, looked at the location, may or may not have taken action. But I can tell you that we did that, I believe, 18 times during this period of time. And by that, I mean after 15 August until we left the country. After 15 August, or you said it was several weeks before we had tar since we had targeted somebody prior to the Abbey Gate? Correct, and we were not targeting before 15 August in any, in any number in Afghanistan. But the, well, specifically, I was answering your question about the Taliban, because the relationship with the Taliban was a direct, direct, highly transactional relationship based on our withdrawal between 15 August and 30 August. And here's the reason that that timeline, that looking at that is, is important to me. As I said, I've looked at it. Your all's comments, your interviews, things that you've said, and speaking on a different subject, you were speaking about Iran, the failure of the Biden administration in taking Iran off the target list. Not that we should drop ordinance on them tomorrow, but that they should be on the list uh, just so that there is deterrence, just so that the, that they know they can't act and not have a response by the United States of America and that that is a failure. And you use specifically the terminology that to take Iran off the target list was to give Iran aid and comfort were the exact words. And it is my opinion that if we are ceasing to target Al-Qaeda, ISIS-K, or the Taliban in those days leading up to August 26th, then just as you looked at a lack of targeting Iran as giving the enemy aid and comfort, 
I would look at giving that enemy, I would look at those lack of actions as giving that enemy aid and comfort. And in that, General, my time has expired. Gentlemen, <clears throat> yields back. Chair recognizes Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome to both of our witnesses. General, General Milley, I just, as an American, I want to thank you for your service and for how you've conducted yourself in that service. Uh, America owes you a debt. You come from my hometown of Boston, just outside Boston, if I understand it correctly. Uh, your father fought in World War II in the 4th Marine Division in the Pacific, is that correct? And your correct. mother was a nurse who served in the U.S. Naval Reserve during that same war, is that correct? She worked at a hospital out in Seattle, took care of the wounded, that's correct. And you had an uncle who served in the Korean, America, uh, Korean War. I had two uncles that were also in World War II, one in the Philippines and one was landing at Normandy when my dad was at Saipan and another uncle that was in the Korean War. So it'd be fair to say your family really answered a call to serve its country, uh, including bearing arms to protect this country and to uh, deter its adversaries and enemies. Is that correct? That's correct. And two uncles in World War I and cousins in Vietnam. Ah, even going further. That's right. And then you yourself deployed in Somalia, Panama, Haiti, and multiple times as brigade commander to Iraq and Afghanistan. Is that correct? That's correct. You're proud of that service? 44 years proud. Are you proud of that service? Absolutely, 100%. And then a retired Colonel Ross Davidson, who served under you in Baghdad, recounted one incident where you ran across a booby trap bridge at night in order to prevent a pair of US tanks from blowing up and thus save lives. Is that incident accurate? It, it's correct. General Milley, on a true social post on September 22nd of last year, Donald J. Trump said, talking about you, quote, this guy turned out to be a woke train wreck who, if the fake news reporting is correct, was actually dealing with China to give them a heads up on the thinking of the President of the United States. This is an act so egregious that in times gone by, the punishment would have been death." Unquote. And a member of the other side of the aisle on this very committee called you a traitor and said, I quote, in a better society, Quislings, referring to the leader of Norway during World War II who collaborated with the Nazis, like the strange I won't use the words used by our colleague, General Milley would be hung, unquote. General Milley, what's your reaction to those statements about you, especially given you and your family's long service, distinguished service to the United States of America, as we're discussing patriotism and protecting troops I wonder how you respond to the kind of slander I've just read attributed to two prominent political figures. Well, let me just And say, if you could move the mic closer so we can yeah, hear you. So obviously I don't agree with the comments, but it's a free country and people can say what they want. But with all due respect, Arnold, I'm here for the families of, of, of Abby Gate. And I'm here for the families of those that served in Afghanistan. Um, and I'll leave those comments as much as I don't care for those comments, I don't agree with them. They have a right to say them, uh, but I'd like to stay focused on these families if, if, with respect. I think that's very much in keeping with the honorable tradition you've set in your own career and your own good name. But as a member of this body, I want to let you know, I find those comments inconsistent with the honor we're trying to bestow on those who lost loved ones, who have served and served nobly their country. You deserve that honor and respect too. And those kinds of comments are dangerous and unbefitting anybody, from my point of view, who serves or seeks to serve public office. And as a member of this committee, I want you to know I renounce them, and I have a very different view of your service. Thank you for serving the American people. I yield back. Gentlemen, yields. Chair recognizes Mr. Barr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General Milley, uh, General McKenzie, thank you all for your service. Um, on July 2nd, 2021, the United States left Bagram Air Base in the dead of night 
without notifying the base's new Afghan commander, who discovered the U.S. departure more than two hours after the military had left. Um, General Milley, um, was your assessment at the time that Bagram Air Base was the most strategically important base in Afghanistan and across the region? I think it was a strategically important air base. However, at that point, uh, the troops had been drawn down to a degree that it was not defendable by U.S. forces, so there was no question of closing it. As far as the specific information of the Afghan command, I read that in the media. I, I don't know. I'd ask Frank to comment on whether he knew or didn't know. Well, sir, sir um, what, was Bagram a key component of U.S. air capabilities to strike ISIS-K and al-Qaeda and to stop Taliban advances? Sure, and it had been for 20 years. And is Bagram Air Base, or was Bagram Air Base, the only U.S. air base in a country with a physical border with China? Um, well, we had several previously, but at that point in time, that was the only one remaining. Um, who, General Milley, uh, made the, gave the order to abandon Bagram? Well, the President makes a decision, announces it on the 14th of April, uh, and the decision very simply was uh, withdraw U.S. forces and keep a diplomatic presence. The embassy is going to remain in uh, Kabul. And if you're ever going to have to do a NEO, then you're going to have to use the Kabul International Airport as the evacuation airfield. Would, it, would a, NEO, down could a NEO have could a NEO have taken place in a more orderly fashion had it been conducted out of Bagram versus H. Kaya? It's, sure, but you don't have the forces to defend. It's it's a question that it's a non-question in the sense that you don't have the forces to defend Bagram. Bagram would have required. Roughly speaking, if U.S. forces are defending it, Bagram would have required about 5,000. If the Afghans are there with you, then you probably could have defended it with 1,800, maybe 2,000, well, something like that. Sir, so who, who, I mean, once you make the decision, Congressman, to yep. go to, to remove U.S. forces, you don't have the option of keeping Bagram. Right. It's so, no longer there. So, so who, who did give the order? Who specifically gave the order to abandon Bagram? And I, I assume the order was delivered to General Miller. Well, it was General Miller's recommendation that if he's going to withdraw U.S. forces, I can't keep Bagram and HKI yep. and defend it with 750 guys. It's, okay, not, so, it's not even feasible. So, so, so that's his recommendation. The plan is brought up to the, through the chain of command. What was the there, was was there dissent within the military? What was the order given against military th uh, advice? To close Bagram? Yes. No. And that's because the previous decision is a strategic decision. Right. To withdraw U.S. forces. Well, well you, so, you, General McKenzie, if I could ask, you, you stated that DOD and state were operating at different speeds. Do you believe that if state and DOD were on the same page, that Bagram could have remained a viable option for the NEO? The, the key point the chairman made is this, um, sir. It's once you go below 2.5K for U.S. forces, you can't hold Bagram. At 2.5, I was enthusiastic about holding Bagram. Scott and, and Miller was enthusiastic about holding Bagram. Understand, but neither one of you recommended to go below I recommended 25. not, my position then and now is stay at 2.5K. And, and, and that's right. General Miller, once the decision is made. Right. I understand, and, understand. Yeah, presidents make decisions, and once that decision is made, we execute. But the point here that I'm trying to make is that the refusal to abide by the recommendations that both of you made would have preserved the option to maintain Bagram and execute the NEO from Bagram. My question is, would Bagram have been a preferable uh, strategic exit versus H. Kaya? So there are problems with Bagram. It's 30 miles away from Kabul. All things being equal, you'd prefer to have Bagram at 2.5K. There's a lot of reasons why you'd want that second air base. And yes, it would have helped the NEO had you been doing it at, at the force level that would allow you to man it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so it was really the fact that the resources weren't there, the troop levels were not there to actually carry out a successful NEO. Um, um, General McKenzie, did you ever make a request to re-seize Bagram either before or after August 15th? We had plans, and I'd prefer to talk about them in a closed session, but we had plans to do a variety of things. My, uh, my time has expired. Uh, I think your advice uh, to the political leadership was the correct advice, uh, primarily because we lost a key strategic asset in the counterterrorism fight. And now, in retrospect, looking at the fact that uh, we, we have uh, 
uh, competition with China, and we don't have an air base there. Uh, huge, huge strategic blunder, in my judgment, without a yield. Gentleman yields. Chair recognizes Mr. Dean. Ms. Dean. It's the second time I've done that. Thank you, Chairwoman. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. <laughs> we need a laugh here today. So, thank you, Chairman McCall. Thank you, Ranking Member Meeks, uh, for holding this hearing. That was good. That was good to come back. Thank you, General Milley. Thank you, General McKenzie, for your extraordinary careers of service to this country and the sacrifice that both you and your families have made for the service of our country. I also recognize the very faithful service members of all of our military, some of whom are here today, but over the 20 years of the conflict in Afghanistan, the more than 2,400 who gave their lives for this country, for this democracy, for the rights that we prize here. I also recognize the Gold Star families who are in the room. You know I care desperately that you get the answers that you need, and I appreciate that both of our testifiers here today have talked about that it is a comprehensive look that you deserve. It is not about a single day or a single month. You deserve the answers to what went right with this war and what went wrong. Um, to the Abbey Gate veterans and families, and I see uh, veteran uh, Sergeant Vargas Andrews and your family, thank you for being here yet again. Uh, I wanted to start quickly with the testimony before the House Armed Services Committee in September of 2021, where Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin said of the timing of the evacuations, as for when we started evacuations, we offered input to the State Department decision, mindful of their concerns that moving too soon might actually cause the very collapse of the Afghan government that we all wanted to avoid. I wanted to ask both of you, what role did the sudden, just almost instantaneous collapse of the Afghan government play in the events uh, following uh, the continuing evacuation and withdrawal? Can you speak to the utter collapse uh, that seems to have surprised most people. So operationally, uh, the collapse meant that at HKIA, we depended upon Afghan support to hold the perimeter. They melted away. And that was probably the most significant immediate operational effect of the collapse of the Afghan government and the attendant collapse of the Afghan military. Now, we had a plan for that. We thought, saw it as a possibility, but that's why we had to put in 6,000, almost 6,000 U.S. forces to replace those Afghans that had melted away. We would have been able to hold uh, HQ with a far smaller number of U.S. forces had the Afghans remained. But when the government collapsed, they went away. So that had a profound and immediate effect on everything else that followed. General Milley. Yeah, I think the, uh, with respect to what General Austin was saying, that was a concern of the State Department, but um, there was a general consensus that with complete withdrawal of U.S. military forces was going to lead to a collapse of the government and the ANSF. The issue was timing when that would happen. Most of the assessments indicated, the intelligence community assessments, uh, were, you know, 12 to 24 months sort of thing. The military actually had a tighter assessment, and we estimated that the earliest time of complete collapse could be in the fall, maybe around Thanksgiving, something like that. Nothing indicated August per se. Uh, having said that, though, um, I, I think that we certainly were advocating for the parallel withdrawal of the embassy personnel and the American citizens with the military um, you know, prior to the events of August. And what role did President Ghani's uh, leaving town? I think that was the, the straw that broke the camel's back. I think it was collapsing anyway, but at that point in time, uh, you, you know, I don't want to make comparisons, I suppose, but uh, you know, you got Ghani and Zelensky, right? Zelensky stays and his military stays in Kiev, and you got a nation at war, and they're fighting tooth and nail. Uh, and then in this particular case, President Ghani is an entire cabinet, less one. One went up into the Panjshir Valley. The rest of them uh, got on airplanes and took off out of their country. As soon as the ANSF saw that, they literally took their uniforms off, put their weapons down, and it collapsed. Uh, it was very, very quick once As that to the drawdown, happened. if I could ask you both, and maybe it's more appropriate to General Milley, but I might be wrong. Uh, under the Doha Agreement, the drawdown to 8,600 troops uh, by June of 2020 was required. But my understanding is subsequent withdrawals uh, were at President Trump's discretion, 4,500 by November of 2020, 2,500 by January of 21, as a new administration is about to take uh, place. Um, it didn't seem ideal uh, by defense officials, 
What, on what basis did President Trump order the troop withdrawal to 2,500 in January of 2021? Um, well, to back up, the requirement to go to 8,600 was 135 days after the signing of the Doha Agreement. Um, and that was executed. Secretary Esper was the Secretary of Defense. Uh, then Secretary Esper submitted a recommendation, and I concurred with it, uh, to withdraw to 4,500 and hold at 4,500 until all the conditions were being met. Secretary Esper was uh, removed from office on the 9th of, uh, of, of November. Uh, on the 11th, the 12th of November, I was handed a piece of paper with uh, the President's signature on it, which had two sentences. One was withdraw all forces from Somalia by uh, the uh, 15th of December, and then withdraw all forces out of Afghanistan by the 15th of January. Uh, we went, uh, the Acting Secretary of Defense Miller and I and others went over to the White House to confirm that order because we had not been consulted on that. Uh, so we did, and that order was then subsequently rescinded, and on the 17th of December or November, uh, uh, another order was received, signed by uh, Robert O'Brien, the National Security Advisor to the President, uh, which directed at that point to come down to 2,500. 2,500 was always given as the min force required by the military as a recommendation to two consecutive presidents. And yet momentarily the president, the former president, placed an order to withdraw everybody. Well, it was a draw down to zero, and then it, you may recall, I think somebody had mentioned it, that there was kind of a, there, were, there was some discussion of everybody's home by Christmas, that kind of thing. But the actual formal orders is what I just discussed. Again, I thank you for your service, and, and I thank all the, the military families. General ladies, time's thank expired. <laughs> Chair now recognizes Ms. Yang Kim. Thank you, Chairman uh, McCall and Ranking Member Mix for holding today's hearing. I want to thank uh, General Milley and General McKenzie for coming before our committee uh, with your testimonies. And I do also want to welcome the Gold Star families and veterans. Thank you for your service. Um, following the chaotic withdrawal of, uh, you know, from Afghanistan, President Biden stated that he owes no apologies for how the withdrawal was conducted. I disagree. To this date, we're still un unclear on how many Americans were left behind in Afghanistan and remain there, not to mention Afghan allies that helped our service members with translation services and intelligence gathering. That could have been prevented if the withdrawal was not carried out in a way that was dismissive of advice coming from the DOD's top leadership. President Biden also promised in an ABC News interview just a few days after the Tal Taliban takeover of Kabul that if there are American citizens left, we're going to stay until we get them all out. Well, that's not happened. So General Milley and General McKenzie, did you consider this promise an order from the president? No, I, I, the ABC interview, I wouldn't consider that an order. Um, we receive orders from the White House in formal um, ways. It has been like this for decades. Typically they are signed uh, by typically the National Security Advisor to the president and then, then that's transmitted uh, to the Secretary of Defense, chain of command, and then the Joint Staff and the Chairman will take those orders, turn them into uh, military orders to transmit to the combatant commanders. So I wouldn't consider an ABC interview or, or any other means of immediate communication as a quote unquote an order. General McKenzie? I think uh, General Milley described it exactly correct. Was there any contingency planning with the State Department to ensure that no citizens would be left behind? After we departed uh, on the, the end of August. Asking prior to the withdrawal, was there contingency planning with the State Department? So we always plan for capacities. Uh, for example, from the very beginning, CENTCOM worked with a number of about 150,000. That's how many people we thought, that's, that goes back to June of 2020. Th that was the number that we thought would have to come out. So the de Department of Defense's responsibility there is to make sure you got the airplanes to move them, you can process them but it's up for the Department of State to say who's coming out, how you're gonna categorize those people, how you're gonna sort them, and how you're gonna get them there. And that's when I would talk about the velocities, the different velocities of the two departments. It, it, you know, we, we were pretty straightforward with our ability to do that, but we're dependent on the Department of State, actually, to make those decisions that turn our ability into actual movement of human beings. Sure. 
Sure. So we talked about how President promised that uh, during that ABC News interview, but when did you realize that President Biden's promise would be broken? I'm sorry, just help me with that. When did you realize that President's promise of getting yeah. every one of the American citizens left in Taliban will be left, I mean, will be, uh, will get them out? When I, did I would, you? Yeah, I would say by, by mid-July mm -hmm. of 2021, I was concerned, given events in Afghanistan, about the state of the Department of State's planning and their ability to execute a NEO. Mm -hmm. Now, I never thought we'd get everybody out. I always thought there would be some, you're never going to attain perfection there. But you'd want to get that number as small as possible. So I was, mm -hmm. I, I knew there would be people left behind. We weren't going to be able to get everybody out, but you wanted to get, get as close to zero as you can. Were you told by that same administration just days later to leave Americans behind if it meant getting out by August 31st? No, I was never told that, but I would share with you my advice in late August was we needed to get out by the 31st. If we did not leave by the 31st, it was clear to me from our intelligence reporting and a number of other sources, we would have been fighting the Taliban. Mm -hmm. So I thought you want to get out by the 31st and then resort to diplomatic means to bring your citizens that don't get out by the 31st out. Otherwise, you're, you're going to have to pour thousands more forces into Afghanistan just to stay there and permanently impair your opportunity to get citizens out, not to mention the tens of thousands of at-risk Afghans that you would like to get out that are actually, of course, at much higher risk. Let me ask General Milley um, my last question. You previously testified that during the NEO, you and General McKenzie both recommended against keeping U.S. forces in Afghanistan past August 31st. So why would you recommend this, even with hundreds of Americans and tens and thousands of Afghan allies left behind? Well, for the very same reasons that General McKenzie just outlined. Uh, I think to keep them past the 31st, uh, you're already at a very small number. You would have had to increase that number by tens of thousands in order to stay there and continue fighting now what would be the Taliban. As far as the American citizens, it wasn't clear then, and it's still not clear to me, uh, what those numbers are or were. Uh, and that was never clarified by anyone in the State Department, exactly how many, where they are, who they are. Are they out in Herat? Are they down in Kandahar? Uh, we, we can't, unless you put tens of thousands of troops in there, we cannot be bouncing around a, a country that's at war and trying to look for this person and that person. It, it's just not realistic. It's not a feasible course of action. And by the end of August, especially after the 26th Abbey Gate, absolutely not feasible. So at that point in time, your choices are extend well into September, October, you could look forever because you don't even know what number you're looking for and you don't even know where they're at. So those weren't feasible or acceptable courses of action at the time, although I do understand the human desire, uh, but didn't know numbers, didn't know necessarily where they were and so on and so forth. So not a realistic option. Got it. Well, thank you very much, Mike. No, time his time's okay. expired. The chair recognizes Mr. Moscovich. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, generals. Uh, for uh, your service uh, to the country. Uh, and echoing comments of my colleagues, I want to obviously extend my condolences to the Gold Star families here and that are, were here earlier uh, and um, paying the ultimate sacrifice uh, for our country. I also want to recognize the sacrifice uh, of our colleague Brian Mast for his service uh, in uh, Afghanistan. Um, a lot of people on this committee do a lot of great things uh, in service to the country. Um, I want to thank our colleague Corey Mills, who just over the weekend helped in getting people out of Haiti. Uh, and I hope, Mr. Chairman, we can soon get a classified briefing on the situation uh, going on uh, there. Uh, this obviously is a very important topic today on what happened uh, with the withdrawal from Afghanistan. Why it did not go according to what the experts uh, in the Pentagon and in our intel community believed. I think we need to know what gaps existed. I think we need to know how that happened. I need to know the lessons that were learned. And most importantly, how do we prevent something like this from happening uh, in, in the future? Um, you know, we had soldiers die over the 20 years of war, and we had soldiers die on the withdrawal. And I, I think multiple things can be true. A lot of times in this town, we like to, it's an and or kind of deal. Right? It's either Trump was responsible or Biden was responsible. Right? I actually think in Afghanistan it's an and-and, quite frankly. Uh, I think there were mistakes 
made in the withdrawal. Uh, I think the American people think there were mistakes made in the withdrawal. And I, I think it's okay to admit that. I mean, what, what's the opposite of that? That the withdrawal was perfect? Everything went according to plan? Um, General Miller, do you think mistakes were made uh, in either the planning uh, phases, things that we thought were going to happen that didn't happen, or things on the ground that unfolded that it, we, we didn't plan for? You think, you think mistakes were made in all of the, that thought process? There's zero doubt in my mind there were mistakes made, and that's the point of the after-action reviews. Identify those mistakes and develop solutions to implement them in the future. Um, and, and I think the fundamental mistake, fundamental flaw, uh, was the timing uh, of the State Department uh, call of the NEO. I think that was too slow and too late. Um, and that then caused a series of events that result in the, the very last couple of days. There's a lot of other mistakes that are made along the way. I try to cover them in a written statement that, that, to, to submit to you guys. Uh, but I think that was, you know, germane to this particular hearing. I think that was that was key. I think that was fundamental. Yeah, and reading the dissent cable, um, which I won't discuss here, but I mean, do you think some of the intelligence that, you know, you all used, uh, our military leaders sure. used? I think the, the for the intel, for the intelligence, uh, we pulled off in the summer of 20. So when we went to 8,600 in accordance with the Doha Agreement. Uh, and then you drop from 86 to 45. You're pulling advisors off the so-called Kandaks, the battalion, the Afghan battalions. What that then means is we don't have a fingertip touch for the, what's going on in the Afghan security forces. We couldn't see. We blinded ourselves when you pull those advisors off. So we relied on electronic means or technological means in order to be able to see what's happening with the Afghan security forces. But technology can't read a person's heart. They can't see the the negotiation that's going on locally between the Taliban and the local Afghan. So we lost our ability to really sense that environment with a degree of granularity that could make better predictions than what was turned out. And I think that's true of the intelligence community, and the military writ large, et cetera. Uh, so I think that was a major gap, was our ability to see into uh, what was happening on the ground because we pulled our advisors out, and, and that's going to happen when you pull advisors off. And, and there's no doubt that mistakes were made by multiple administrations over 20 years um, that I'm sure uh, we'll, we can point to when the full after action review is completed. You think it was a mistake by the previous president to invite the Taliban, which you call a terrorist organization, to Camp David? I, I won't comment on that. That's a political act, and I'll stay out of that. I, 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 but on mistakes, if, I, I think one of the key ones, to be very candid with you, is the, the development of the ANSF writ large, which begins, of course, in early 2000s. And I was part of that, Frank's part of that, and many of us were part of that. Uh, the number of security forces were too small. Uh, we had estimated, we the military estimated, we needed six to 700,000. Decisions were made by the bond agreement to, to field them at 350,000. Half of those were police, and they were completely un, un, uh, not designed well for a counterinsurgency type of environment. So you're looking at about 175,000 army and the Taliban had fielded about 100,000 Taliban. So your force ratios, your correlation of forces between the insurgent and the regime forces uh, was always balanced more in favor of the Taliban. And then they had a sanctuary over in Pakistan. These were decisions from 04, 05, and 03, that kind of thing. But they have second and third and fourth order consequences to the outcome of this war. So by the end of the day, the Taliban uh, or the uh, ANSF there was mirror imaging going on. We tried to build the conventional army. We didn't build their commandos and special forces till late. Uh, th there's a whole series of these that go way back uh, in time that ultimately end up in a collapse of the Afghan security forces under intense pressure by the Taliban in the summer of 21. Thank you, General. My General, time has time expired. expired. Chair recognizes Mr. Heisinger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman uh, and generals. Um, I'm going to share a couple of, of quick stories, and one of those was related to those Gold Star families uh, that are here. Um, I had a constituent who didn't lose his life, but was severely, severely injured in the blast. I, uh, I don't use his real name. I call him Jose. He was a Marine. Uh, he was a 240-pound machine gunner that, uh, when I first met him, was about 175 pounds after he was recovering from his injuries. Uh, this young man, though, so dedicated to his country, he re-upped. Unfortunately for the Marines, they didn't take him back. 
uh, but he's now a Navy corpsman and uh, has, uh, has still continued to try to serve his country. Um, what I'm frustrated about is what seems like the subservient behavior of the State Department and DOD, frankly, to a lot of us. Um, it seems that some individuals within the departments chose to save face for the administration rather than acting and possibly bringing home an already, uh, uh, sorry, rather than bringing some shame to a, to a, a foreign policy that, uh, that was a disaster. And um, this could have saved both American and Afghan lives. Uh, General Milley, you talked about the number of citizens, how it was impossible to know who was there. Um, I found myself screaming at the television when I was watching a DOD brief, I'm sorry, a Secretary uh, 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 Blinken and others within State Department briefing saying that their estimate was about 200 U.S. citizens, most of who chose to stay in Afghanistan. That was total BS, and I'd like to say the actual words, but I'm trying to not restraining myself. My office alone had nearly 200 open cases 200 cases, not 200 people, 200 cases in my congressional district alone. And as I talked to my constituents, or my, I'm sorry, my colleagues, they were having similar numbers. So this, this fantasy that we didn't know that there was US citizens over there or where they were or what they were doing is a complete fallacy. State Department should have been talking to us and they were not. The other story I have on that is about one of those citizens. Um, he was uh, an interpreter um, with, uh, with the Army. Um, he was able to escape Afghanistan. He's a US citizen now. He is here in the States. His wife was not as fortunate. Her first two attempts at entering um, uh, Hkaya, she was beaten almost to death by the Taliban. Now, there was a little problem. The U.S. Embassy had her passport and had all of her information. Guess what they did? They destroyed it all. They destroyed it all on the um, retrograde. So they printed off, she had to print off a letter to that she could then show. Guess what that letter proved to the Taliban? <laughs> Where she was going. And uh, so after the second beating, she left. We were getting literally phone calls into the office. Uh, woman Beatrice in my office was literally talking to her in the middle of the night. The third time she went was when the explosion at Abbey Gate happened. Fortunately for her, she was not one of those 170 Afghans that were killed. <clears throat> and fortunately for my constituent, Jose, he wasn't one of the 13 Americans who was killed. We welcomed her home to the United States this past weekend, finally. If that is not an indication of a broken, broken policy and broken system, I don't know what is. I know she's dealing with the literal physical and psychological scars that this government has put on her. Very quickly, General McKenzie, what information uh, about American citizens did the U.S. pass to the Taliban? Very limited information, and you'd really need to talk to state because they were the agency that did it. But it was designed to get them through, typically in convoys into the compound. But I, I, you'd need to go to the Department of State okay. to get good are, information. Are you aware of those claims, even by some State Department employees, that the Taliban was beating up American citizens and others like, like, uh, like my constituent and his wife, uh, the, who were green card holders? I'm aware of those claims. Are you aware of the claims that the Taliban beat up or even killed Afghan allies outside the gates of HK? Yes, I am. Um, Mr. Chairman, we had the sniper who had the bomber in his sights here in front of our committee before, and that was run up the chain of command, and he was denied the ability to take that sniper out. That's a breakdown. Um, and I believe that the security control of Kabul can contributed to this violence. I know my time is up, and I, I've got a few other questions that I'm going to put in writing through the, through the chairman. Um, but at the end of the day, this was a shameful situation all the way around. I appreciate your willingness to work with these families and meet and talk with them now, but we must have accountability. We must.
And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman yields. Chair recognizes Mr. Keating. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, the Gold Star family's here as a Gold Star uh, family member, my uncle being killed in action. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, condolences are your loss and uh, gratitude, uh, eternal gratitude for the great sacrifice uh, and courage uh, of those we loved. When I was uh, first elected, uh, I visited our troops right away uh, in, in Iraq, then in, uh, uh, in Iraq. And I came upon a Marine and I, I asked him, you know, in conversation what his opinion was of the war at that stage. And he looked at me and told me one of the most important lessons I learned. Uh, he said, well, sir, uh, I'm here to serve. Those kinds of decisions and those questions you're asking, well, those are yours. Those are political decisions. And I think what we have this morning, in effect, is a little bit of the replay of that conversation. We're asking two generals uh, I deeply respect and thank for their service uh, to comment on political decisions that, that thrust on them. Uh, and much of what we have should be turned around. We should be out there, and maybe they should be up here asking the questions. But nevertheless, it's where we are. I just want to comment on one title of this hearing. Uh, and that's the fact that um, the last sen uh, you know, section of that is the Taliban takeover. This is like a, a sequence that's there. I just want to correct. Um, not one decision led to the Taliban takeover. Uh, and many of the decisions we had here clearly wouldn't have resulted in the Taliban not taking over. Is that correct, General Milley? I, I think, as I mentioned several times already, <clears throat> There's a series of strategic decisions that set the conditions, and those decisions are made over the course, frankly, of 20 years. And then, of course, there's a series of decisions at the end uh, that impact this very specific uh, withdrawal in NEO. But yes, it's the yeah. cumulative effect of multiple decisions. I couldn't agree more, and that's the way we should view this. Although I think there was a linchpin to the, today's testimony that helped uh, underscore something, too, as we're looking at things. That's when uh, General McKenzie was talking about the fact that keeping 2,500 more troops at uh, Bagram Air Force Base would, could have been helpful, assuming, assuming the Afghans stay in the fight. And, and one of those key decisions, frankly, uh, that got us to where we were uh, at the end of this uh, was the decisions that surrounded the Doha Agreement in, in that sense. Now, General Milley, I mean, I think one of the critical things was excluding the Afghans from those discussions. Could you comment on that at all? Well, I mean, it's a historical fact that the Doha Agreement was made between the United States and the Taliban. It's a bilateral agreement. The intent was, uh, and I, you'd, have, you'd get a better answer out of Ambassador Calizade or Secretary of State Pompeo, but I think the intent there was for that to occur, the U.S.-Taliban negotiation, in order to set the framework for an Afghan to Afghan negotiation. And the Afghan to Afghan negotiation never happened, and there was supposed to be a reduction in violence and then a ceasefire, then Afghan and, to Afghan negotiation. And uh, former Ambassador John Bass said our main policy efforts uh, didn't reinforce each other, they were contradictory, they were contradictory uh, signals amplified by President Trump's periodic statements supporting rapid force reductions, and taken all together, they undermined the Afghans' confidence in the U.S. security. I mean, that was a critical point as well. But we could point to so many critical points uh, in, in this whole process. This is uh, uh, a 20 year look back, which we should. We're looking back to learn lessons. This is a 20 year look back, uh, at, you know, four different administrations two Republican, two Democrat, uh, two decades. These are decisions that uh, culminated uh, in uh, the final occurrences that occurred. Uh, and. That's the way they should be viewed. Uh, we can dissect them. We can go back and classify it after this and, and learn more in detail. But we, we're going to learn this, that we're working for the one thing I think any family member would want, so that no other American family has to go through what they went through. Uh, it's important to look back at the past. But it's important to look for the present. Here's my final point. I can't sit here on March 19th at knowing what's going on in Ukraine now, knowing that we have an Article 5 responsibility uh, and, and that Putin has put in his sights 
NATO countries as the next target after uh, he gets through with Afghanistan, and I, with uh, Ukraine, rather. So I just ask everyone here uh, on this side, uh, the political side, when we have a supplemental ready to give support to the Ukraine government, we must act on it now, because failure to do that will jeopardize in the future the lives of other brave American men and women who are there under a treaty of Article 5 to defend uh, our word in this world and defend democracy in Europe, the same democracy that my uncle died for. So I hope and, and just implore everyone here, put the bill on the floor for a vote. The present is important, the future is important, and saving the lives of uh, courageous young American men and women is important. I yield back. I agree with that assessment. Chair recognizes Ms. Rodewagen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General Milley and or General McKenzie. In April 2021, President Biden announced his decision to draw troops down to zero. What was your assessment of the threat environment in Afghanistan at that time? So my opinion then and my, my opinion now was that if we go down to zero, uh, you're going to see a rapid collapse of the Afghan government and the Afghan military. It would be difficult for them to sustain themselves because they were not prepared to stand alone. Did you advise against any part of the withdrawal as announced? And if so, what concerns did you have and to whom did you raise them? So ultimately, I participated in meetings at the very highest level where I expressed the opinion I've just stated to you, and it was heard. So I, I, I don't want to go into specific discussions with the president, but I had the opportunity to express my opinion at length, and I did so. In September 2021, you testified before the House Armed Services Committee that going below 2,500 was the other sort of nail in the coffin. Did you hold this belief in April 2021, and did you provide this assessment to the president or anyone else in the administration? So my, my assessments are typically provided to the Secretary of Defense, and he forwards them on as he, as he wishes. And I've had the opportunity to be in higher level meetings, and I've expressed my opinions in those meetings. But generally speaking, my, my assessments go up through the Secretary, and he's the, he's the agent that carries them over to the interagency process. Did your military leaders on the ground in Afghanistan raise any concerns to you about the withdrawal? If so, what were their concerns? Well, sure. So General Miller, four-star commander in Afghanistan, his position mirrored mine, and the concerns that I've just articulated to you were those that were completely shared by Scott Miller. And in fact, many of my positions were developed from his initial analysis because he was the commander on the ground. What was your assessment of the strength and movements of the Taliban at the time? I think the Taliban, uh, from after Doha, the Taliban benefited from the fact that we were striking them much less frequently and with much less force, particularly after we began some of the programmed drawdowns that were part of the Doha agreement. So they began to become larger, bolder, and, uh, and more aggressive. Now, key point is they also drew back considerable, like 100%, but 99% of their attacks against us and most of their attacks against us were probably low-level Taliban commanders who didn't get the word. On the other hand, their attacks against Afghan forces uh, increased in ferocity and didn't come down at all, and they began to hit them very hard during this period of time. So it is my judgment that the Taliban grew better and bolder during this period of time. Do you believe the State Department was on the same page as the U.S. military in April 2021? I'm just trying to, let me think about that for a minute, and I would say I, I think that the intent of the Department of State was to maintain a diplomatic platform in Afghanistan, even after we withdrew our military forces. I did not believe that was a feasible action in that I didn't think that the government of Afghanistan would be around to be the partner for our diplomats once we removed our military capability. It was a divergence of opinion, and that divergence of opinion lasted until August when we actually began to withdraw our embassy. Well, what was your assessment of the State Department's planning during the retrograde and in the lead up to the non-combatant evacuation operation? So I felt they were moving at a slower pace compared to us. We felt the immediacy of the problem. I felt the state was 
just for a variety of reasons, not moving quickly. I felt strongly enough. So then mid-July, I took my concerns formally to the Secretary of Defense and outlined them. And I felt it ranged everything from the number of potential consular officers that we could use to process visas to what we might or might not do for lily pads across the region if we had to pull people out uh, to detail plans from the, from the embassy itself. A variety of things that concerned me and also particularly the requirement for closer collaboration with the embassy and our State Department partners as the situation on the ground began to get worse and began, in fact, to accelerate. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yield back. Gentleman yields, or Gentleman Lee yields. Uh, Chair recognizes uh, Mr. Uh, Davidson. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I thank you, uh, Generals, for your presence here today. Hopefully it provides us guidance in how to take as many lessons learned as we can from this uh, horrible and largely preventable disaster in Afghanistan. So far, this uh, administration, the Biden administration, has presided over the evacuation of, an 11, of 11 embassies. I think that's a record. Uh, General McKenzie, you uh, highlighted that the State Department makes the decision on when we need a non-combatant evacuation operation. So there is a civil-military interaction there. The State Department makes the call. It's their decision. But where does the responsibility for execution become the military's? Well, ultimately, in a NEO, that the ambassador in country is the ultimate representative of the government of the United States for the execution of the NEO. That's, that's, that's policy. That's actually what we follow. Now, we support them, so it's our responsibility to you know, get the aircraft together, get the security together, do all the things that have to happen. But the ultimate decision-making authority on when we come out and who comes out and how we come out, even to some degree, is a Department of State responsibility. Yeah, so uh, a, a long time ago, when I served in the Ranger Regiment, uh, we trained non-combatant evacuation. I never uh, had the experience of executing one of those. And it seemed inconceivable to me that the State Department would ever make the decision that Let's get the military out and then count on some path afterwards for some of the civilians to get out. How did that decision evolve, that we were going to get the military out knowing that there were still American citizens behind? So it, it, it remains, it was my opinion then and my opinion now, that that particular decision was the fatal flaw that created what happened in August. The alternative was, of course, as we began to draw down in mid-April, to begin to bring our embassy, our... But I mean, even back. as in, in August, when, when the decision was unwinding and, you know, Joe Biden had foolishly picked a date certain instead of a condition certain on the ground, no matter what, hell or high water, we're getting out on August 31st, um, you knew that you were going to leave American citizens behind, but as that date approached, it, was it really still the State Department that said, no, we're going to stay here? Uh, with the, we're going to get the civilians out some other way, but the military's got to go. Absolutely. So that's the State Department's decision. So that's a foreign affairs decision here in Congress. Uh, so we need to provide some accountability for them. And that's part of the goal of this hearing. Um, one of the other problems that the State Department had for the whole execution of this war on terror has been rules of engagement. So uh, could you explain the, the role of the State Department in uh, working with the De Department of Defense on rules of engagement? Sure. So at my level, the combatant commander level, I had no input from the Department of State on my rules of engagement. My rules of engagement came from the chairman, the standard CJCS ROE, uh, and were existed solely within the Department of Defense. So there was never a crimp or a pressure on the rules of engagement that we gave the force in Afghanistan or Iraq or anywhere else in the Central Command Theater as a result of Department of State. So that pressure. wasn't the State Department then? It was not. So how did it break down? Defense. How did it break down? That, so between the time the rules of engagement that apparently you all felt no need to change, must be working well, how did it break down that, that uh, Sergeant Tyler Vargas Andrews couldn't get a commander to make a decision. So I mean, a, frankly, it seems like the sniper should have been trusted with a decision, maybe a call to a platoon leader, company commander. But even up at the battalion commander, he couldn't get somebody to make a decision. What was broken? So that's a tactical question at a very low level. I don't know the exact details of that, but I can tell you this. The first principle of any rule of engagement is if you see or if you, were, if you feel a threat, if it's intent or in action, you always have the right to defend yourself. Well, over the years, the big problem was that you held the junior enlisted guys accountable for a lot and the officers and civilian accountable for almost nothing. Now, I'll admit every now and then, a general got fired and they put a different one in, but they didn't go to jail. They didn't lose everything. 
They just left Afghanistan. That's not how the junior enlisted guys were treated. So you really think that they felt empowered to make those decisions? Sir, I can only say that in the defense of uh, HQ, we employed these rules of engagement three times with lethal effect under conditions exactly as we're discussing. So yes, a, I believe, a lot of that I, sounds like you're blaming the guys on the ground for not making a decision. I, I really don't think that's what happened. Personally, now I wasn't there, but I do think that that crosses over into Hask, and we got our divisions here in Congress on that. But when I look at the civilian side, when I look at the foreign affairs, the public policy side, the side that frankly a lot of people here in this body are supposed to make, Congress is supposed to declare our wars under our Constitution. They don't generally get around to doing that, uh, but they also set a mission. They work with the, with the National Command Authority to set missions, and for a long time in Afghanistan, we had something along the lines of, as much as it takes, as long as it takes. We had a previous witness that come in, and he had written op-eds, and going all the way back to 04, overseeing operations in Afghanistan. General Milley, is that an acceptable mission statement for anyone wearing a uniform? No, of course not. There should be a defined end state, uh, and you should have the ways and means to achieve that end state. And you should understand the purpose of what you're doing, the constraints and restraints, and you should understand that end state. And the end state in Afghanistan, <clears throat> starting in about 2011-ish, 2012, became a negotiated settlement between the Afghan government and the Taliban uh, in a power-sharing agreement. That's how they. That's how the policy was. And at the control. time, the, the question there, my application of that is to say that when we decide that, I think we should expect a better mission statement. And we could serve everyone from well, the combatant statement. commanders all the way down to the Sergeant Tyler, uh, Sergeant Tyler Vargas Andrews uh, on the ground yep. by providing clearly defined success. And that applies across the board, whether you're talking Afghanistan <coughs> or Ukraine or anywhere else. I, I wish I had longer to talk with you all, and I look forward to reading your uh, additional uh, submissions and uh, but I, would be I happy to collaborate in any way. If I could, Chairman, just our mission statement, and you know this well from being a ranger and, and I know many others in the room as well. Our mission, the U.S. military mission statement was to prevent an attack on the United States of America from the territory of Afghanistan. That mission was accomplished for 20 consecutive years. You accomplished your mission. Every soldier, sailor, airman, and marine accomplished their mission. This country was defended for two decades. Gentlemen, I yield. Uh, chair recognizes our Vietnam veteran, Mr. Baird. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate you uh, holding this uh, session. And, you know, I want to add my condolences to the, the Gold Star families. Uh, as the chairman mentioned, I did my time in Vietnam, and I can appreciate the sacrifice that those families and those soldiers made during that war. So I also appreciate the general, uh, General Milley and General McKenzie for both of you being here and willing to talk to us and see if we can find some answers to help these Gold Star families. And so I really do appreciate that. And, you know, um, I, I guess I want to go to the, to the point of also mentioning that one of the uh, 13 service members that were killed uh, during that evacuation uh, came from my district, and that was Corporal Sanchez. And so I expressed my condolences to that family as well. In fact, I attended the, the funeral, and, and uh, it's always uh, unfortunate when we lose service members. But I guess I, guess I want to, in that same vein, I want to change uh, my focus a little bit uh, to the fact that we left about $7 billion worth of military equipment and weapons that was intended for the Afghan military. However, it was abundantly clear that prior to the shutting down the Bagram Air Base that the administration knew that the Afghan army was destabilized and demoralized. And it was just a matter of time uh, till the Afghanis would fall, uh, leaving these weapons in the hands of the Taliban. So last year, these weapons started to pop up in other conflicts, including Kashmir region, and this was left a war chest of weapons in the hands of the Pakistani-based military group that are designated by the United States as FTOs, foreign terrorist organizations. So General Milley, did the Biden administration have any advanced knowledge that the U.S. weapons and equipment 
left behind would not uh, be used by the Afghan military and would be seized by the Taliban. And so when was this decision made to notify the Afghan military about these new possessions of these weapons? Th those weapons, as you mentioned, were part of the foreign military sales uh, or assistance over 20 years. Uh, so that's seven billion is over 20 years. <clears throat> How much of that, those weapons uh, were throughout the whole country, uh, I mean, they were spread out all over the place. So there was no specific indicator that I can recall that said this group of weapons is gonna go over to the Taliban or anything. We knew that the Afghan military had those weapons. Those were out there. These are weapons, these are night vision devices, these are wheeled vehicles, et cetera. Uh, but there was nothing that was specific to say uh, this unit or that unit is gonna hand off their weapons to the Taliban or any of that kind of stuff. The, the general, but, but I think an important point here is the United States military did not leave that equipment. Uh, that, is, that equipment was given to the Afghan security force. So when we gave, in Vietnam, the war you fought in, when we gave equipment to the South Vietnamese Army, the Arvin, and the North Vietnamese overran South Vietnam, the Americans didn't give that equipment to the North Vietnamese Army. That's the Arvin, that's the South Vietnamese Army doing that. So the same thing is true, in, say, in Korea or anywhere else. So I wanna make sure that, you know, we're, we're that it's not a U.S. decision on that equipment because that is Afghan owned equipment at that point in time. And it's completely impractical, frankly, it would have been quite dangerous for us to try to go out and try to police up that equipment in the summer of 21. It wasn't, it wasn't feasible. We had 2,500 special forces guys and that kind of wasn't their task and purpose. Um, the Afghan government collapsed, the Afghan military collapsed, and the IG, the special investigating IG, estimates $7.2 billion worth of U.S. manufactured equipment, not U.S. owned equipment, ended up in Taliban hands. And I do believe, I think there's probably some reporting out there that indicates some of that equipment has been sold on black markets, et cetera. And I have zero doubt that some of that's in the hands of people who have nefarious objectives towards the United States. I thank you, and uh, my time is uh, expired, so I yield back. Gentlemen, yields. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Waltz. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you for the witnesses for coming in. I got to tell you, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the more I listen to this hearing, the more infuriated I get. Um, and I know the Gold Star family sitting here have to feel the same way. I know every veteran watching today has to feel the same way, because it's not about us, it's about, it's about them. And I think what upsets them most, uh, General Milley, General McKenzie, are some of the statements from the president uh, during, this, during this evacuation, including an interview that the president gave on national television during the withdrawal on August 18th, saying the generals never advised me to leave 2,500 and the only air base, Bagram Air Base, in the world sandwiched between China, Russia, Iran, and a platform to stay after counterterrorism. General Milley, is that an accurate statement that the generals never advised him to leave a stay-behind force to keep a lid on half the world's terrorist organizations? I will tell you what my thoughts were at the time, um, my assessment well, you, at the time. Let me just say, you've I, testified today, you both testified repeatedly yes. that you advised the National Command Authority we should leave a stay-behind force, including the plus base. NATO plus That's contract. right. That's correct. Did President Trump leave that stay behind force despite his stated desire to get everybody out because the Taliban didn't leave, meet the con conditions? When the administrations changed hands, there were 2,500 soldiers and that was a Did you decision. then, uh, and you've stated today you didn't advise Biden to pull everybody out, you advised him to stay. That's correct. So that's an inaccurate statement, but let's go down the list here. Let's go back to July of 2021. President Biden, there's a likelihood the likelihood there's going to be the Taliban overrunning everything and owning the whole country is highly unlikely. Does that comport with your knowledge at the time? In fact, you, you just a few weeks later said Kabul will be surrounded in, in 30 yeah, so to 60 I, days. My assessment at the time was if we went to zero in U.S. military forces, then there was a high likelihood of a collapse of the government of Afghanistan 
did and the ANSF with the Taliban taking over and, would collapse. But I thought it was going to be. I, I personally thought it was going to be in the fall, somewhere around Thanksgiving. The assessments vary widely. We're talking within months. Within months of our right. withdrawal, that's correct. The next one, there's going to be no circumstance where you see people being lifted off the roof of an embassy in uh, 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 an embassy of the United States from Afghanistan. It's not at all comparable with Saigon. I think this picture proves that not to be the case. Fair enough. Uh, Joe Biden. July 8th, 2021. Next one, Americans should understand we're gonna try to get it all done before August 31st. And if you're an American, if there's American citizens left, we're gonna stay to get them all out. Was that your understanding of the operational planning at the time to stay beyond August 31st or were you planning to get out by August 31st? We plan to get out by August 31st. Last, but perhaps the, the most egregious, we believe about 100 to 200 Americans remain in Afghanistan with some intention to leave. You both testified today, you just testified, General Milley, that it was impossible to know the number. In fact, is that accurate? It was very difficult to know the number. Very difficult, and I don't think the numbers were accurate. Yet the State Department's revised that number since to nearly 1,000 Americans left behind. Uh, look, in July of 2021, Bagram is closing. We're withdrawing our four-star commander, General Milley. Ghani is visiting President uh, Biden, practically begging us to at least leave our contractors and some little bit of air support. General McKenzie, you've testified that you were so concerned in July of 2021 that you put up recommendations, including lily pads to get our allies out, putting pieces in place to process our SIVs faster, putting measures in place to get our American citizens out, to get our allies out, and to take care of what American military should do, which is protecting all Americans. You were so concerned in July of 2021, you put those recommendations forward. That's what you've testified today. That's correct. And in fact, also, the diplomats on the ground, Mr. Chairman, sent a dissent cable, 23 diplomats saying, if you continue down this road, disaster will ensue. Was that dissent cable shared with either of you? This is a formal channel going to the Secretary of State himself. Was that shared with you as the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs? Was that shared with you as the Commander? I've never seen it. I've, I didn't see it at the time and I haven't seen it since and I would like to see that dissent. I cable. think the American people would like to see that. Chairman, but here's my question for you. Do you know where the Secretary of State was on August 13th? I, the day before Kabul fell? Do you know where the Secretary of State was despite all of your concerns? State Department wasn't planning fast enough. We weren't getting our people out. According to the Washington Post, he was in the Hamptons. He was in the Hamptons on vacation. Secretary of State Blinken. I don't know, I can't even imagine how that makes our Gold Star families feel. Look, here's the bottom line, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your indulgence. I'll, I'll close with this. The State Department, to use a military term, had its head up its rear. It wasn't planning. It, in fact, thought we could just have an embassy and the good, the good Taliban terrorists will take care of the bad Taliban terrorists. I mean, that's essentially what happened. And because of that, we didn't get our people out. We didn't get our citizens out. We didn't have the force posture. We, don't have, we didn't have the basing. We failed and their loved ones are dead because of it. I apologize to you to my Gold Star families, your government failed you. There is a difference, gentlemen, and I know you both know this, in taking responsibility and accountability. A lot of people have taken responsibility. No one has been held accountable, and they deserve but better. Your government failed you, and I'll give you an opportunity in my time remaining, Mr. Chairman, if there's anything you all would like to say I'll publicly the on the record. I'll time to uh, respond, but the time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The, the gentlemen's, uh, they have a right to respond. Well, I'd like to take you up on that offer. I, I've talked to these families. Um, and, and I, I thank you for I've that. I've met the other families. Um, and, and I have committed to them, and I will do so again publicly to all of you, that I will work with them to get you the answers uh, to make sure that accountability Transparency is established, and I'm going to do that to a dagger in the grave. That's what a soldier does. 
and I'm not going to turn my back on these families or any other Gold Star families. There are other Gold Star families in this room right now. Jane Horton's in this room. I've been working with her for years. There's many others, and they know who I am, and I will work with them forever. They deserve accountability, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, General Milley. I agree 100 percent. Chair recognizes uh, Mr. Kane. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank our witnesses for their uh, service to our country and recognize the, uh, the Gold Star families who are joining us today. Um, General Milley and General McKenzie, you uh, mentioned today with some frequency um, about the uh, impact and lack of coordination regarding the withdrawal of U.S. troops and its impact on uh, U.S. contractors, advisors, and logistics. Uh, what impact did that have on the Afghan military? So the pulling out of contractors and advisors had a profound effect on the Afghan military's ability to operate. General Milley's already talked about when we came off the Kandax, to use a term of art, when we lost our ability to see down in the combat formations back in the summer of summer of 20, that was a major, that was a major blow. But then when we made the decision to go from 2,500 to zero, you're bringing out all your, all your people that actually make sure the Afghan logistics, logistics system works. Let me give you an example very briefly. So before we went, before we went below 2,500, if a box of our, uh, mortar rounds went into Afghanistan, you drop it on the ramp at HKIA or maybe Bagram, there'd be a contractor there, you'd tag it, you'd have visibility on it as it went down through the Afghan system to get to the Kandak it was going to. Once you pull out that capability, you drop the mortar rounds off on the ramp and you have no idea where those things go, no idea at all. They could be going directly to the bazaar. They could be going to the Taliban. You just don't see it. So that, that capability is gone. But more perniciously, perhaps, is what it meant to Afghan aviation, the one sort of asymmetric advantage that they had. So we wanted to keep our contractors in there as long as we could, but they had to come out. We tried desperately to come up with schemes to help them. We looked at long-distance televideo uh, maintenance, which has been tried by airlines in the United States with indifferent success in a technically literate population. So we knew we were swimming upstream with this. So it, I cannot, uh, it's difficult for me to overestimate the negative synergistic pernicious effect drawing down these capabilities had on the Afghan military. Yeah, that, was, that was obvious for, for people to estimate in advance, and it was obviously what happened on the ground. And this was foreseeable. This was not a surprise. Yeah. And, and so did the U.S. ever come up with a plan to properly make up for the loss of these key capabilities? We tried, you know, what I'd call heroic measures. We had a forward over-the-horizon, you know, um, security cooperation office in, uh, in one of the Gulf countries, but it just doesn't work. You can't, you have to be there. you got to be with your partners. And uh, the, the degree to which you're not with your partners, it doesn't mean you're fighting for them. You're not doing that. What you're, help, what you're helping them do is manage complex logistics systems and, and ensuring that graft and corruption isn't overwhelming. But you pull that all off and you lose that visibility and, use the, and you lose the ability to help them as well. And so that was, I think that's a significant factor in the collapse of the Afghan military in 2021. Um, was there any long-term planning for how the U.S. would be able to continue to support a long-time allies in the Afghan military at all? We did, but again, you know, so you work under the conditions that you're given to operate, yeah. which is there's not going to be anybody on the ground. So, you know, you're going to, ideally, in a perfect world, there'd be 650 U.S. forces guarding the embassy and a handful of people in the embassy that might be able to do some limited, limited form of security cooperation. But nothing at the ministerial level even, and certainly nothing at the core or the formation levels that's there. So was, really very hard to see a way forward. Was President Biden ever informed that the U.S. military hadn't yet figured out how to provide logistics and maintenance aboard for the Afghan military? That's a question I can't answer. I just don't know the answer to that. General? Yeah, I think there were, there were plans presented. Uh, they certainly weren't uh, optimal, as Frank just pointed out. But he was, he was witting of the contractors uh, coming down and the potential impacts uh, and that the mitigations, the over-the-horizon mitigations and remote maintenance, et cetera, but I think everybody recognizes with general consensus that nothing's going to replace uh, the contractors on the ground. You're, you're looking at about, if, if my numbers are correct from my head, <clears throat> I want to say there were about 20,000 or so um, over the summer of 20. That comes down to about 10 maybe uh, in, into 21. And then you start glide path and into maybe eight or nine. But there's still a significant contractor capability there. 
until we come out in July, or in the first or second week of July, and that's when it basically goes to zero. And the contractors aren't going to stay unless there's American military forces to protect them. And these are DOD contractors, U.S. Mil U.S persons, right? And then there's contractors from Europe, and then there's contractors that are local. So the number of the contracting pieces are, is a really significant factor to the collapse it, of the ANSF, in my view. Given the amount of time that's passed since the American withdrawal, in retrospect, are there any actions that you wish that you would have taken that may have prevented this catastrophe? I think the, the for me, the, the biggest thing is to uh, synchronize the, Af the, the uh, withdrawal of the U.S. military with the State Department. And I'm an advisor, not a commander sort of thing. And, and, and it's to, to I mean, we, we said it over and over and over again. There's probably um, other things, I guess, that could have been done. Um, that's my biggest regret is I go back through all these meetings, et cetera, um, on that whole issue of the State Department coming out with the military in the in July, really, is what we're looking at. Gentleman's time's expired. Uh, chair recognizes the gentleman from Thank Texas. Thank you. I yield back my time, Mr. Self. Uh, I apologize, Mr. McCormick from Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Congratulations to both generals for your retirement. Hopefully, you're enjoying that somewhat. And congratulations to Sergeant uh, Tyler Vargas Andrews for his retirement. Hopefully you're enjoying it as well. Thank you for being here today. Um, listening very intently to your testimonies today, um, General Milley, when, when you and I were together last time at the Hass Brief, we went to back and we talked about some of the things that, that happened to create the collapse and kind of the predictability about it. I thought it was interesting that General McKenzie talked about knowing that this was going to be a total collapse of the government pretty early on when you could see how this the, the withdrawal was working rapidly against us. Uh, the interesting thing you talked about, we sustained the mission, you, you very clearly stated just a second ago, was to make sure that forces were not being trained and deployed from Afghanistan to harm Americans, and it was successful for 20 years. I would agree. Uh, when I was there in 2016, uh, there were very few American casualties. It was a relatively peaceful place. I mean, the Afghanis were still paying the price. There was a lot of violence, but, but they weren't training bad guys. But after spending $2 trillion, 20 years, 2,462 lives, 20,700 plus casualties, plus the years away we all spent away from our families, we then lost it during a withdrawal. And now how many billions of dollars were left behind for them during that, that withdrawal? How many billions, gentlemen? 7.2 billion left behind for the enemies to use. And how many training bases are over there now, training enemy combatants against the United States? How many bases, approximately? That I don't know. Uh, it would be an intelligence question for the intelligence So the non-classified brief is about 27. So $7.2 billion worth of military gear, somewhat brand new, and 27 bases to train enemy combatants now. So I'd say we failed our mission, and, and we'd already paid the price. That's what, that's what irks me, is my friends that are no longer able to come home, my friends who have lost lives and limbs and time away from their family, uh, the money that we spent, the time we invested just to give it back to an enemy that now <laughs> we're not fulfilling the mission we set out to do. And we did fail miserably, in my opinion, especially on that one day, the withdrawal. Uh, to hammer that home, the example that we had, which Sergeant uh, Vargas Andrews so succinctly said during his testimony, is that he testified before about the Kabul airport bomb uh, bombing in his testimony. He informed the committee that his team was tracking a suspected terrorist who align exactly with descriptions given by Intel and is believed to be the Abigail bomber. He further testified that after being denied initial permission to engage the suspect, he elevated the issue to his battalion commander, Lieutenant Colonel Brad Whited. According to Vargas Andrews, when asked if they had permission to kill the suspect, Lieutenant Colonel said, I don't know. He's now a colonel. I don't understand where we've gone wrong, that we don't have a mission statement that allows a lieutenant colonel in charge of very capable people to make decisions that would save lives and limbs, and then they get promoted for it. I don't understand where our accountability went, not only in our mission, but our withdrawal, and even a mission statement for that very day. Can we speak to that, please? Because if we don't have accountability, then why are we here? Because if we didn't learn our lessons from what we did wrong, 
why are we here? And if we're not answering to the people who lost lives and limbs, why are we here? I can speak to the rules of engagement piece. General McKenzie's already spoke to it. The standard rules of engagement that you're familiar with and that Corey Mills is familiar with and uh, former Colonel Self and everyone, you know, Colonel Waltz, et cetera. It's positive ID, hostile act, hostile intent, and pull the trigger. You don't have to ask permission of anyone. Every single soldier, sailor, airman, marine, ship's captain, or fighter pilot has the right to self-defense. And if you perceive, if, if it's your understanding in that moment in time, whether it's Afghanistan or anywhere else, by the way, except continental United States, if you perceive those conditions to obtain, then you are fully empowered by law to use lethal force if necessary. So, now, so having said that, I can't speak, and I don't actually know the specifics. Well, so you don't know, but here, here's the funny thing, sir, yeah. is that neither did the Lieutenant Colonel. I don't know. And, and I would say that if I was starting, and I'll, I'll finish my piece, sir. Congressman, I know the rules of engagement. I, so do I. No, I don't know the specific incident Well, that you well let me tell about. you what we, I'm, I'm telling you what this, yeah. the testimony was. And, and here's the problem is, in our litigious society where I've seen soldiers and sailors and Marines get in trouble sure. for making the wrong decision, when they ask their right. commanding officer, they expect a clear answer, not I don't know, that costs people lives and limbs. And uh, I'll yield with that. Thank but you. My, my guess is that Congressman Waltz, when he was there, my guess is that perhaps uh, then Sergeant Mills or others that are on this committee engaged the enemy with lethal force and were not asking permission. I don't know the specifics of that particular case, but I know the rules of engagement are clear and they're trained. Uh, and I would have to personally <coughs> interact with Sergeant Vargas, which I have not done yet and I want to, uh, or Colonel Whitehead, I think his uh, name is, or the company commanders, et cetera, to, to find out what did break down. Obviously, something broke down. I, if Sergeant Vargas had a positive ID on a known enemy target, and that enemy target was hostile act or hostile intent, the rules of engagement allowed it. Gentlemen's time has expired. Mr. Self is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for being here and your testimony. General McKenzie, uh, before I go there, I was going to ask the, the question on the ROE because We've had several conversations, and I was still unsure as to who had the ultimate authority. Thank you for that answer. One has to wonder, though, if he had taken the shot. Uh, in ROE, in my experience, my 25 years, deployments on four continents is absolutely crucial. If he had taken the shot in today's military, one has to wonder what would have happened to our young sergeant. But, General McKenzie, my question to you, um, on August the 26th, at a press briefing, and I'm trying to sort through the dates here, exactly what your intent was, uh, you said that you had a common purpose with the Taliban in the evacuation. That was on the 26th. Now, you've testified here today that you were also telling people that we had to get out by the 31st or we were going to be fighting the Taliban. Can you just walk me through those five days later you thought we would be fighting the Taliban from a common purpose on the 26th to full-scale combat on the 31st? I'm trying to, what was your intent sure. between so, those five days? Uh, certainly. Let me just briefly talk to the ROE question for a moment. So between 16 and 26 August, three teams did take lethal shots okay. with this ROE, and nothing happened to the individuals that took the shot. So let's be very clear Thank when you. we talk about this. Okay. Uh, three people applied the ROE with success and with lethal effect. Okay. So we had an agreement with the Taliban we were gonna be gone by the 31st of August. Mm -hmm. That was, a, a, we negotiated that at a very high level. That was not a military decision, uh, but it was rather a policy decision by the president. We were gonna be out of Afghanistan. And it was clear based not only by vo voluminous intelligence reports that if we remained beyond the 31st, not only would we be fighting ISIS-K, but we'd be fighting the Taliban as well. That was, that was very clear in the intelligence reporting that we were seeing. So when I talked to the Taliban in Doha and in the days afterwards, it was clear they wanted us to leave. We wanted to leave. Those were the orders we had was to get out. So we did have a common purpose, and that common purpose was leaving Afghanistan. 
the non-combatant evacuation, by definition, is an operation where you're leaving. So yes, we shared a common purpose. I don't trust the Taliban. I don't like the Taliban. It's a highly transactional agreement, but it was designed to let us get out. And I will tell you that we certainly did not outsource our security to the Taliban, but I am confident that we would have had more Abbey Gate attacks had we not negotiated these limited agreements with the Taliban uh, for some of the external security that they provided. Yeah, I was going to ask the two of you your assessment of the Taliban because most people just refer to it as Doha, but I always want to bring to people's attention the formal name of what we refer to as Doha. The agreement for bringing peace to Afghanistan between the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan, which is not recognized by the United States as a state and is known as the Taliban and the United States. That's the formal name of this agreement. Uh, I have a copy here and I've been following your testimony uh, uh, closely as you've done it. Uh, I use the, the, the term naive with the ambassador Khalilzad. Uh, when he testified before this committee uh, just several weeks ago. Uh, I think the entire agreement was, uh, was naive. I think it was poorly negotiated, and I think the two of you, along with uh, General Miller and others, were put in a horrible position uh, by that agreement. Um, this, uh, I've heard the words here from the other side of the aisle, highly partisan hearing. Uh, I will tell you I agree with several of my uh, colleagues here that have said we are still paying the price for that go to zero decision. We are still paying the price around the world. Putin started moving troops within two months. Uh, we now see the, uh, the Red Sea uh, in its uh, current condition, Gaza, uh, Hezbollah standing ready. Um, I will tell you, I, I think, and I'm gonna, uh, I, I think what we engaged in, General uh, Milley, was not so much defending our nation, because I believe the mission of the United States military is to go and break things when our national interest requires it. Uh, 20 years there, we should have said, uh, we're leaving. If you do it again, we'll come whomp you again. We'll break things in the interest of the United States again. And my last point is, I'm glad that one of you mentioned uh, the sanctuary, because that was our fatal mistake in Vietnam, uh, the sanctuary across the border in Laos and Cambodia. And it proved a fatal error in, in uh, uh, Afghanistan and Iraq as well. There was a, there was a sanctuary, a cross-border sanctuary. Uh, last question, real quickly. Uh, Qatar is now playing a part both in Afghanistan, getting our folks out of Afghanistan, and in Gaza. Was Qatar a part of any of your discussions before this? Was, did it play a part? It was principally where we went to negotiate with the Taliban. It's where they hosted them. Uh, they did not have a significant effect beyond that. I will say, as we left, uh -huh. they began to flow. Uh, they, they flew people back into Afghanistan. The Qatar does a number of things across the region, as you're aware. Right. They, walk a, they walk a very tight, uh, thinly defined line between a number of competing interests, and they were certainly active in that at the very end of the Afghan engagement. I don't think the line is as fine as you make it. I yield back. Gentlemen's time's expired. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Hill. Gentlemen, thank you for voluntarily coming before the committee, and we're grateful for your 86 years of combined service in uniform to this country, the country that you love. And to our Gold Star families, we're here for you. We're here to conduct oversight in your name to get to the bottom of uh, this disastrous outcome after two decades uh, in Afghanistan. And for me, it's a source of great disappointment because I do think our, our nation is less safe the way we exited because of the precedent that set and the signal it sends to our adversaries around the world. And I think uh, it was a mistake by the president to uh, exit in his method also as it relates to our ability to support our allies in that region. General McKenzie, I was really struck with your opening comments uh, and this is, follows lines of Congressman Sherman's uh, questioning about playing a little bit of the game between the Trump administration and the Biden administration. But you made a very good point in your opening comments. You said that you, uh, uh, you briefed uh, President Trump in June of 2020 and that there had been a, uh, I took it to be a DOD and state comprehensive exit. So military exit, State Department exit, uh, our strategic uh, 
Afghan partners exit and then obviously American citizens exit. Is that true that that took place in June of 2020? The plan I briefed on 3 June 2020 to President Trump accommodated the number of people that were at the embassy, uh, accommodated the number of citizens that we knew were in Afghanistan and projected number of Afghan at-risk people. It was not a plan that was coordinated with the Department of State. Right. But it did reflect the capacity to bring those elements out. So that, that got me considering, and that was from DOD's perspective, what it would take to accomplish right. those four goals. Good. So then subsequent to that, between uh, June 2020 and the inauguration of President Biden, did state and DOD work to fine tune a joint approach to accomplishing the goals of the June 2020 brief? No, we, we, no, nothing substantive was done. They maintain a NEO plan that we've talked about before. We continue to refine our plan going forward to, to account for the reduced numbers. Right, uh, and of course, uh, General Milley just testified to that a few minutes ago about his conversations with Secretary Esper and right. coming down to That's correct. Uh, the Christmas and then January number on the military side. So that implies then that upon being sworn into office that President Biden and his advisors took the decision to get out completely. When was the first time, General Milley, that you were told that the president, the president had taken the decision that we're going to exit completely from a planning point of view, not the date you agreed to, but just from a planning point of view? Yeah, that was, um, well, the announcement was on the 14th. If my of, memory serves me right, I think I was uh, informed on the maybe the 11th, right, uh, something like that, but it's just prior. So upon that announcement, would you say that the Department of Defense and State began a coordinated effort to accomplish the goal, uh, goals of the June brief to President Trump? Or was there no effort to get, as you both talked about today numerous times, both departments, State having the preeminent role on exiting the nation uh, and, and DOD a it was, subordinate it role? It was a coordinated effort, coordinated interagency effort led by the National Security Council and uh, we did a uh, what's called a TTX or a rock drill, a rehearsal of concept drill on 8 May. Uh, and there were several of these type of things. There was tons of coordination uh, being done. But the fundamental flaw, the fundamental principle uh, was to, or the, the decision was to leave a diplomatic president, leave the embassy there. Uh, and that is leaving an embassy in a war zone while simultaneously withdrawing your military forces. Um, we strongly thought at the time that the embassy should come out and that it was not tenable to keep an embassy in a war zone. Uh, and and uh, so we thought they should yeah. be coming out. Thank you for that. Let me switch subjects to the subject of equipment, equipment owned by the Afghan National Forces. At any time during that planning, from the early Trump planning in June 2020 until spring of 2021, was there a contingency plan to as you saw, the situation could deteriorate to also uh, disable the uh, fixed ring, rotary wing, or larger artillery pieces that were belong to the Afghan government. I'll let uh, General McKenzie speak to the specifics, uh, but yes, we, we disabled as much equipment that we could prior to departing. But on U.S. equipment, I'm talking about the equipment belonging. You testified a few minutes ago oh, the distinction other... between also Afghan government. Uh, some of it. Yeah, I'll let Frank talk to the details. So the Afghans were using that equipment. So we, you know, in order to allow them to use it, we didn't disable it. I would tell you at, at places like HQ, at the airfield, where there was Afghan equipment there after we established the perimeter, we did, in fact, destroy all that equipment. It'll never be useful to anybody. Yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, I just want to announce the White House and congressional leaders have agreed to grant 12,000 special immigrant visas for Afghan nationals who assisted the United States. Um, it will be in the State Department Foreign Operations Funding Bill. I think that was uh, certainly uh, supported by me and the ranking member as well. Um, I just want to say thank you, because it is something that we both support and we're working on. That's what I was talking about. Can't say, hey, we left them behind, but we're not going to give them a visa to get, to get out of there, right? Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Mills. And hey. thank you for your service getting Haitian Americans out of Haiti. Well, it's an honor to be able to do this, to be able to help Americans out of Haiti, as we did with the 255 that we got out of Israel. 
and as we did with the Americans out of Afghanistan. So there is a pattern of abandonment that has existed throughout this administration that I'm going to call attention to immediately. I want to thank the Gold Star families who I consider to be friends at this point and who we've had many long-standing conversations with. And I can tell you, Steve, that many of us will be looking to get all charges dropped, which never should have been levied against you to begin with, for a grieving father who lost both of his sons, who understandably would be upset when there's still been no accountability. Responsibility, people taking a lot of responsibility. Oh, it's my fault, it's my fault, it's my fault. These same individuals are continuing to get promoted. These same individuals are continuing to serve. These, these are people who are allowed to serve after making critical errors that cost lives, but people who refuse because of religious and medical exemptions are being purged out of our military who are willing to serve. Think of the irony of this. Now, I do want to thank both of you for your service. I'm going to ask a series of rhetorical questions, but they're needed in an effort to try and base a context of my further questions. Uh, Mr. Milley, can you tell me exactly kind of what your description of your job was as chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff? I mean, it's codified in law that chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff is the senior military advisor. He's not in the chain of command, military advisor to the president, secretary of defense, and national security council. Uh, and by extension to Congress, um, and it, it, his, his job or her job, and it's to be the senior military advisor of a group of people called the Joint Chiefs of Staff. We are all the chiefs of the individual services. You represent the Joint Chiefs, and you represent their advice to the President and the Secretary of Defense, uh, and if there's any dissenting advice, you give that as well. But tra uh, traditionally, your, an your, your role is an advisor. It's an role. advisor. It's and an advisor General person. McKenzie, your role as commander of CENTCOM is actual ground force operation command, is that correct? Joint force operation command. Joint force I'm in the chain operation of command. command, I'm responsible for Which everything. Which means at the end of the day, the whatever happens on the ground, the buck stops with you, correct? That's correct. So I'd like to ask a question because I understand the advisory role and I think that General Milley's made it very clear the direction in which he had advised and it was very different than what this administration has done and I think that you have testified to the same. But I do have some issue with some of the things that was said. I think that when you look at the Secretary of Defense, he has made comments before this committee to say that there was no actionable or credible intelligence that was provided that could have led to the understanding of when the suicide bomber was going to do this. However, I think you've all read the day-to-day -day intelligence reports, as have I in a classified setting, that would speak very much to the difference of that, even to the extent and, and the clarity of saying, moving into this location of this city, planning is commenced, planning is finished. Execution is imminent. And these are the day-to-day -day data logs that we all saw, which will prove that there was credible intelligence that could have been rendered on that. Not to mention the fact that there was in the State Department, who I put a tremendous amount of responsibility on, and have requested multiple times for Anthony Blinken to go ahead and step down, the 23 dissent cables, which warned early on what would occur in this. Now, my only real severe issue that I've had as of late, General McKenzie, is that You've made multiple comments in the media and otherwise to the extent that a brave hero, in my opinion, who has sacrificed his limbs for this country, Sergeant Tyler Vargas Andrews, that his recollection of the events that took place on August 26, to quote you, sir, that he was not recalling this correctly. And secondly, you said that you claimed there was no bolo that would even meet the description. Now, this is the rhetorical part of this. Where were you on August 26th, sir? Tampa, Florida. Well, I can tell you where Sergeant uh, Vargas Andrews was, and he was sitting at the gate. And I would trust on-ground information far more than someone who's sitting 9, 10, 11,000 miles away, who's potentially watching from ISR and potentially being briefed by the commanders on the ground that his testimony, which has been corroborated, by the way, by multiple Marines who have testified before this committee, that the events that he has actually made common and made clear actually did take place. And we're fortunate enough, General McKenzie, that the gentleman who actually endured the most from this, who was on the ground, and ground truth matters, as we all know, is sitting right there. So would you like the opportunity to tell Sergeant Vargas right there that he is not recalling the incidents that occurred on August 26th correctly, that he and his fellow Marines are not actually the ones who said there was a bolo of this description, that he is incorrect in his assessment, are, which is putting into question his integrity. Do you want to face him and tell him that before him now? I don't want to face him and tell him that. I want to say that the battlefield is a very complex place. 
There were a lot of threats that were flowing around out there that day. I honor his service. I regret he was injured. Have you spoke to him since then? I have not spoken to him so since So you obviously then. haven't honored him, nor has anyone else come to even question him about what took place, even after our committee a year ago. I so believe the bottom that you are line, wrong. Sir, I'm still I talking. He has Sir, no General, the bottom line is, is that he deserved that respect like these Gold Star families deserve that respect. And to question his integrity, to question what took place on August 26th that he observed from his own eyes and sacrificed his limbs for, that you're unwilling to actually face him and actually tell him the same thing that you were willing to say to MSNBC and all the rest, which is that his recollection is incorrect and that there was no such thing, it's shameful. With that, I yield back. Gentlemen, he yields. My understanding is the two generals have met with the families, that they are willing to meet with uh, Sergeant Tyler Vargas Andrews. And you deserve that. Sir. Yes, you do. Uh, with that, uh, Chair recognizes Mr. Lawler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just to follow up on my colleagues' uh, questions uh, here, uh, General McKenzie, when did you retire? Uh, 1 April 2022. Okay. And General Milley, when did you retire? I came out of my duty position on the night of the 30th of September, and I officially retired 1 November. Okay. And so at any point, uh, between the disastrous withdrawal in Afghanistan and to today, have either of you spoken with Sergeant Vargas Andrews? I have not personally spoken to Vargas. I want, no, to, I I want to speak to him, but I, I have not. That's correct. Okay. He testified before this committee a year ago. Sure. Are you both aware of that? I am. Did you watch his testimony? I did. I did not. Did you get a report on his testimony? Yes, I did. And at no point did you feel the need to reach out to him or ask for a meeting based on his testimony? For me personally, that would be inappropriate because while I was in uniform as chairman, uh, there's an active investigation that was going on. Sergeant Vargas was part of that. Uh, and it'd be very inappropriate for me to meet with any of the potential witnesses during an active investigation. And from your standpoint? And the CENTCOM investigation has actually been reopened. So that's still an active investigation. So no, it would not, I would not. I would not have. Okay. So based on an active investigation, how are you going to meet with them today if We're that's not the on standard duty anymore? So the, that CENTCOM investigation has been closed. It has not yet right. been briefed to the families, but that investigation is no longer active. Okay. Plus, so we're we're, we're, as of today, you're both going to seek to meet with them. Yes, but also we're in different statuses now. So we're no longer on active duty. He was a commander. I was a chairman, and you don't want unlawful command influence on an active investigation. So that's while in uniform. Now we're not in uniform, and I want to meet with Sergeant Vargas. Okay. Uh, with respect to uh, the decision by President Biden to announce uh, September 11th as the deadline for full U.S. military withdrawal, uh, was there any tactical or military reason for that date? Not that I'm aware of. Not that I know. Okay. So was it purely political and... Uh, from the standpoint of uh, a, a symbolic date, from your understanding? I'll be candid. I don't even know where or who made the decision of the 11th September thing. Um, I, I frankly thought it was actually inappropriate at the moment in time, but it was very rapidly changed to the end of August. And you were never involved in the decision to no. do that? Not, not to pick the date, no. Okay. Um, General McKenzie, you stated in your opening statement that you and you alone are responsible for the military operations uh, that occurred during the withdrawal. Um, again, I asked, did you set the date for the withdrawal? No, I did not. Did you make the decision to bring our troop level to zero? I did not. President Biden is the commander in chief. Did he make those decisions? Yes, he did. So is it your position that he bears no responsibility for the aftermath, that you are the only one that bears the responsibility for the military operations? So I was responsible for military operations. The commander in chief is responsible for those and all the other operations to include those of the Department of State, all the other appropriate cabinet agencies. But I- But you report to the commander in chief. I do. Okay, so at the end of the day, is he responsible for the decision to set the date and to set the troop level to yes. zero? Yes. So he bears responsibility, not just you. That's correct. Okay. Um, General Milley, you told the Senate 
and House Armed Services Committees in September of 2021 that one provision of the Doha Agreement the Taliban adhered to was the most important one, which was do not attack us or the coalition forces. You said that the Taliban did not attack U.S. and coalition forces. Uh, didn't the Taliban carry out at least some attacks against U.S. and coalition bases in 2021, including indirect fire attacks? There were, but the Taliban themselves, the senior leaders who were part of this negotiation, they would deny that. They would. The Taliban is a very amorphous organization. You know, you never can be certain if they have total control over their individual units with indirect fire. There were some attacks. Uh, the issue was a lethal attack. Um, really, that's the fundamental piece. And there was also some specifics about no V-bids in the cities. So in other words, it def depends on the definition of it? I, I mean, no, no, what do you mean? Not at all. Not at all. So it says no attacks on the, the and I think uh, uh, Congressman Self has the agreement. I don't have it in front of me. But I think it says no attacks on U.S. or coalition forces. Uh, I can tell you in conversation with Zal Calizé, what they're talking about here is lethal attacks, really. <clears throat> but also, there's some specifics, I believe, and I'm doing it from memory without a document in front of me, about no V-bids in the cities, no mass casualty attacks, those sorts of things. Now, the, the problem is, is they, they did adhere to most of that. There were some attacks. They weren't lethal. <clears throat> but they did pick up the pace on attacks on Afghan security forces. And that's really significant. Uh, by my memory, I, I think we're looking at somewhere between 30 and 40,000 attacks. It was like the, peaking, the peak of attacks on Afghan security forces occur in 20 and 21. It's, it's a very significant amount of attacks on the Afghan security forces, uh, leading obviously to the summer of 21. But uh, the idea of not attacking coalition or U.S. forces, I would say largely that was adhered to by the Taliban. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Moran. Thanks, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Uh, both gentlemen, thank you so much. Both of you gentlemen have made statements calling for transparency and understanding regarding the withdrawal from Afghanistan, and I agree with those statements. I want to pause also at the beginning and uh, recognize and thank the Gold Star families that are here today in this room and con to convey my condolences <clears throat> for their loss, their deep loss uh, of their loved ones. I also want to recognize Sergeant Tyler Vargas Andrews, who is here, and thank him for his dedicated service to this country as well and for his testimony last year. It was very insightful. But I want to come back to you guys. Thank you both for uh, being here today and undertaking this pursuit of truth. That's what we're here to do. I know you've had a long day. We're just about done. Just a couple more of us left. But the American people certainly deserve the truth, and the families who lost loved ones most certainly deserve it as well. So I want to ask both you guys a question I don't think anybody's asked today, and that's generally if you have advice for this committee as we look forward uh, into the future as to how do we look towards additional transparency and accountability in this regard, what further witnesses should we interview as a committee to better understand what happened wrong with the Afghan engagement and the withdrawal, and how can we do better next time? So that's my first question to you is what additional witnesses ha does this committee need to engage with? Well, um, I mean, I'm not obviously in Congress or any of that. There's rules in Congress, and there's uh, for you to get an accurate tactical picture of what occurs at HKI at the time of the NEO, et cetera, it seems to me you'd have to ask the tactical commanders. You'd have to get them, you know, this, this is General uh, Donahue, this is Admiral Vaisley, this is General Sullivan, but you're not the Committee of Oversight and Jurisdiction on the military. That's the House Armed Service Committee. So, I'll, you know, that I don't know how you do that. Uh, but if you're going to get an accurate picture, you're going to have to, obviously, you, you've interviewed with uh, Sergeant Vargas and others. There's, there's lots of people along the line that will need to be discussed. The second thing is documents. <clears throat> and Chairman McCall, I think, mentioned it up front. There is a lot of documents. The vast majority of them are classified, and many very highly classified. Um, and how that would work between, say, the Department of Defense, Department of State, CIA, et cetera, and the various committees. But to get a full, comprehensive, holistic picture, you're going to have to get documents and all that. That's going to take a long time. And there's rules that govern all that. And I think you guys know those rules. So the documents and the witnesses, but the specific military witnesses, um, I think that would have to go. I, I don't know the rules 100 percent here, but I think that has to go over to the the House and Senate Armed Services Committees, okay, not, thank not you. this committee. 
Uh, General McKenzie, let me let me just ask you uh, about after action reviews. As you guys went through after action after action reviews after the evacuation, uh, who was involved? When did those first ones take place? When's the last one that, that you participated in took place? Mm -hmm. And excluding any kind of executive privilege discussions, would you talk about uh, what were the top frustrations that were communicated during those after action reviews and maybe top two of the consensus positions of what we could have done better or what we should do differently next time? Sure. So the after action reviews begin pretty quickly after an operation's over because you want to capture people's uh, remembrances while they're still very strong but, and before they go on to do other, before they go on to do other things. So we had a series of those at every level. Every unit does it. Some of them come to CENTCOM's level. Some don't come to CENTCOM's level. But if I were going to pick a couple of things that, uh, that I think I would, I would hit on, I would be, first of all, the requirement to absolutely be better integrated with the Department of State. And I think it's been a common theme today. We're only partially responsible for that. But I think that's a, that's a very key thing. The second thing would be, and it's not a bad news story, but it's just a story that you need to continue to, to work on, is you need to understand your strategic lift requirements what's going to be required to get out of some place, how you want to scope and scale that. I think those are a couple of things that are that are absolutely very important as you take a look at it. If I were just going to pick two, those are probably the two I'd, I'd, I'd look at first. And then last topic, yes, sir, General. Hey, I was just offer one more thought there. One thing that you may take a look at is the law on lead federal agencies with respect to non-combatant evacuation operations. Who has decision authority, ambassador, or a combatant commander, Department of State, Secretary of State, or the De Secretary of Defense. Right now, the law is ambassador and Secretary of State, but that's something that might be taken a look at because command and control and the decision authority and who is in charge matters. And when you make these calls matter. Um, so I think that's something, I believe it's codified in law, actually, about the Department of State. I'm not positive about that, but I think it is. Quick question about chain of command. Uh, when uh, the team on the ground was <clears throat> seeking uh, authority to uh, take out the, the, the pro, pro, uh, prospective bomber and they saw somebody that matched the description, they were told, quote, leadership did not have engagement authority for us, do not engage. Did we ever figure out what happened in the chain of command there so that the folks on the ground did not ever get the authority to engage with who might have been the bomber that day? I don't have personal knowledge of that. that. That's one of the reasons I want to talk to personally talk to Sergeant Vargas. Yeah. I don't have personal knowledge of that set of asks or denials. Um, I know the rules of engagement, what it authorizes, but I don't have personal knowledge of those conversations back and forth. Okay. Gentlemen, time has expired. Let me clarify uh, for the gentleman from Texas. We are working with the Committee of Jurisdiction over DOD, that's Armed Services, to get a document production, including the sniper photos that Tyler testified to, that he handed over to the commanding officer and the command center uh, in my opening statement, that has yet to be produced. We expect that to be produced. Uh, in addition, the, these two gentlemen are at a very high level. The, the COs on the ground are Admiral Vasely, General Donahue, and we have requested through HASC as well that they testify before the Congress we will vigorously pursue this, and if we have to do it with a joint hearing, which has dem been done before, of arms, you know, armed services and foreign affairs, uh, that is our plan, and we're not going to give up on this till we get the answers. Thanks. And uh, we do have a classified briefing, I want to say, uh, after this, so I want to get through this. We have Mr. Burchett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Like you, uh, my father was a World War II veteran, dad was a Marine, and he told me the only thing generals ever gave him was a hard time. So I fully expect to get that <laughs> from you all. You don't need to write that down, but that's just that's just me personally. Um, this is for either one of you. Marine, World War II, and he said the same thing. Do do what? That my father was a Marine in World War II with the 4th Marine Division. That was the first same Marine thing. Division. Uh, his colonel was Chesty Puller, so thank you. Um, this is for either one of y'all. The Taliban was in violation of the Doha Agreement. Why did we remove our troops? I think that's a question for policymakers, not for either of us. So you all, yeah. that, you all, I guess what I want to get at is you all weren't, weren't involved in the consultation of that. We absolutely were involved in the consultation, and we pointed out repeatedly that the conditions were not being met. 
That's what I wanted to know. Can you explain why the arbitrary deadline of August 31st was chosen as the date of removal from Afghanistan? And was the State Department or Department of Defense the ones that chose this date? Didn't choose the date, but I can tell you some of the logic and thinking that was going behind that. So the date of May 1st is the Doha Agreement. Right. Uh, the, this current administration, the Biden administration, comes into office on the 20th of January. And then the first week in February, actually, I think the first meeting is either the third, fourth, or fifth, or something like that. But the first week in February is uh, the beginning of a 10-week deliberation that was quite rigorous, actually. Lots of meetings, lots of readings, et cetera, uh, by the National Security Council to include the current president. Uh, and then the decision or the guidance to the State Department was to get additional time, work with the Taliban, postpone them one May, and I think the most that the State Department could get was, I think, whatever that is, six months, I think it is. Uh, and that, so that then bounds your problem from time of decision, 14 April, not going to go with 1 May, and, and it takes you out X amount of days. I think it was whatever that is to the end of August, September. But that was, that was the backstop, and that was because of negotiations between uh, Zal Khalizade and the, and the Taliban as to how much he could push it to the right. 13 Americans, including uh, my constituent, Staff Sergeant Ryan Knauss, and 170 Afghanis were killed at Abbey Gate. Um, do y'all consider this withdrawal a success? Well, as I said in the op my opening statement, and I've previously said in several um, previous testimonies, I think it, the whole thing is a strategic failure. I've said that openly several different times. But at the same time, I want it really clear that the United States military did its job and the United States military did what was asked of it and that anyone who served in Afghanistan or any family of the fallen or any of the wounded, uh, every single one of them did their job, did what bravery and courage could ask of. They did it with professionalism, they did it with dignity, they did it with courage, and they did it with compassion. So I believe the United States military executed its mission uh, and I think that they did so uh, with great professionalism. And my dad had another saying, I'm sure he stole it from somebody, but old men make decisions and young men die. And that is apparent that's what happened here um, and those old men being at the State Department. Would it have been better to choose a measure of operational success rather than a date when deciding y'all's date of withdrawal? I think one of the lessons, if you want to call it a lesson, I suppose, is uh, don't put date certains on uh, things like this and don't, don't announce them and don't put date certains. Uh, that, that's basically you lose whatever leverage you might have had if you're involved in some sort of negotiation. It seems to me that we've never learned that lesson. We always announce these dates and then um, whether it be um, Vietnam or some other debacle and it just seems to always end the same way. Um, General McKenzie, you're not getting enough air time, so I want to ask you a question, if that's all right, brother. What was CENTCOM's official assessment of the ties between the Taliban and other terrorist organizations, and do you agree in hindsight with those assessments? So I think we had a pretty consistent assessment that the Taliban was opposed to ISIS. They had theological disputes, and the Taliban, given an opportunity, would push ISIS out of Afghanistan and they tried to do that on a couple, of, a, a couple of occasions, but had limited success. On the other hand, their ties with al-Qaeda were deep and profound, and there was no way, in my judgment, that they were ever going to separate from al-Qaeda. And so that, those are the two major organizations that you see operating in the region. So ISIS, yeah, given a choice, they'd just as soon be rid of them. Uh, Al-Qaeda, they're not going to take that action. Now, today, ISIS-K probably is the more potent of the two threats, but it's difficult to project into the future. All right. I've run out of time, but I'm just like to say to the families, I hope you all find some peace in your life, and I hope the Lord blesses you all. And thank you for the sacrifice. Mama lost her brother in the Second World War until the day she died. When they played that national anthem, she teared up. And I hope you all have some, some real peace in your life. So thank you all. Mr. Very Chairman, good. apologize for going over. Gentleman yields. Chair recognizes Mr. Issa. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General Milley, good to see you again. General McKenzie. Uh, I was looking over 
your long and distinguished careers. And what I noticed was you were both on active duty just before I left active duty. General Milley, you were promoted to first lieutenant in 18 months. I didn't get that lucky, <laughs> and I wasn't that good. You said something, General Milley, that I think was profound. You, in, in fairness to the United States military, there were no military mistakes while under military command in this case. And that brings a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, during the, both of you during the day have said we should see more, we should hear more, and so on. If, if I could point out something to see if you've seen it, they've distributed it to you. The question is, here's a public log that shows a vast amount of uh, uh, a video that I haven't seen. I've not been made aware of it. Some of it is redacted, but most of it you can read what it says. And the timelines uh, are pretty uh, pronounced. Do you believe that, I mean, obviously that exists. This was a FOIA. Have you, either one of you seen any of these videos, and do you think we should see them on the committee as a whole? General McKenzie? So I've probably seen most of these videos at one time or another. Uh, I, I should certainly see no reason why you shouldn't see them. Okay, it won't surprise you, we haven't. So when this became aware, we became aware of it, I wanted to ask. Uh, I want to point out uh, 211, 214, 217, and 223, General McKenzie. Do you recognize those, and are they of particular significance? Uh, also, 212 and 213. I read the title. I understand what it says. I, I just can't associate it with a video. Okay. Well, we'll well, hopefully we'll see them. General Milley, uh, during your career uh, rising through the ranks, I had four careers. One of them was here in Congress. So I do want to correct one thing you said, uh, which is very unusual for a nobody private or captain to do, but we do have the jurisdiction. And you said it very well in your own statement, and I'd like to point it out for the Gold Star families that are here. This committee could, all or in part, change the question of who is in charge, Title X or not, in the case of an armed withdrawal. We could decide whether the chief of mission continues to be accountable to somebody back in Foggy Bottom, or whether you would have been in the uh, direct chain going back to the Pentagon. We could put primary responsibility on the amount of forces necessary in each and every, and General McKenzie, you know your Marines and what they do. You know how many more we have after Benghazi. You know what happened because of Benghazi and what General Amos did. So for the Gold Star families, this committee does have at least most of the jurisdiction to decide whether or not a State Department that in our own investigation clearly made decisions that were counter to the safety of Americans there, counter to the safety of our allies, but not necessarily counter to their own safety. Although in fairness, the decision not to move uh, the embassy either out of the country or to the, uh, the military base instead certainly contributed. So uh, General, both of you, General, and, and look, I'm, I have nothing but respect for your service and for the tough situation you both found yourself in in this withdrawal. But I'm going to ask you to basically answer a, as much of a yes or no as you can. If you had had the authority to determine the continued presence, would it have been dramatically different from a standpoint of safety of American personnel? Let me make sure I understand the question. You're talking... If, if you'd been told that we were withdrawing, right. would you have done it differently as a military man rather than the I way would, it was done? I would have begun sooner. Would have begun sooner. That's probably the principal thing I would have done. I would have begun much sooner than when we actually did. And I would have, same, I, I would have brought the, the embassy and the State Department out with the military by the middle of July. That, that, that is what, if there was one thing... A do-over, you don't get do-overs in this stuff, but if there was a do-over, that would be it. And, and that, that point was debated and discussed and so on and so forth. But that, that is a yes. To answer Last that, question, I, I uh, Mr. Question. Chairman, if you, I may just. If you had been given the opportunity to determine that you wanted Afghanistan to stay 
free and independent of the Taliban. Would that have been possible at, during your chairmanship? Well, I, I think that if you kept 2,500 as your men force, and it wasn't just any 2,500, this was a, a group of 2,500 that were uh, very, very highly talented special forces. I think that group of 2,500, plus the NATO forces, plus the contractors, <clears throat> I believe to this day that the Afghan security forces and the Afghan government would not have collapsed. But I also know, believe, and I believe it would have happened, is that the war with the Taliban would have reopened. And that could have possibly meant another increase in forces. So if your purpose, the, the political strategic purpose uh, made by policymakers is to withdraw, then the idea of keeping 2,500 with the possibility of even increasing is obviously a cross purposes. So if, if I could surmise or sur, you know, summarize what you said, if we had had the same attitude in Afghanistan that we have till today in South Korea, that in fact, if there is an adverse combatant force that is unrelenting, you keep sufficient forces in order to prevent them from prevailing, even if it's more than half a century. Well, I, I think that um, if your intent, your strategic intent is to uh, you know, prevent Afghanistan from becoming a platform for terrorism to strike the United States. Uh, and to do that, you've got a, a means, the government of Afghanistan, the Afghan security forces. Uh, and if you withdraw, they're going to collapse. Then I think you either accept the risks of that collapse. And if you're going to do that and withdraw completely, then I agree 100% with what General McKenzie said earlier. You're going to have to withdraw quickly, fast. That includes your State Department folks. Uh, or make a decision to stay. It's a binary choice there. Uh, there's not a lot of gray in between. Uh, and I think that if, uh, if you decide to stay, there's risks associated with that and the, and the likelihood that war would again would start with the Taliban. And the Marines Gentlemen's concur, with the, Marines concur uh, with the Army in this case? Uh, Gentlemen's time has expired. Ms. miller Meeks is recognized. Oh, I didn't realize. Thank You've you. You've been keeping a five-minute I thought rule. it was done. I thought it was, okay. I thought it was a closing right. act, Chairman. I'd like to thank Chairman McCall for the opportunity to wave on this hearing today and to our witnesses for testifying for before me. the committee and for the Gold Star families that are here. The reason I wanted to be here at this hearing is that I'm a 24-year military veteran, Vietnam Air veteran. My brother served in Vietnam. My husband is a 30-year Vietnam Air veteran as well. My father was career Air Force. Six of his eight children served in our military. The botched withdrawal from Afghanistan in August of 2021 was the single worst foreign policy disaster of the United States that has not been witnessed since the fall of Saigon. And I mentioned this at a Homeland Security hearing in June of that year. This completely preventable catastrophe resulted in the deaths of 13 U.S. service members, one of which, including uh, Corporal Dagan Page, grew up in Red Oak, Iowa, and 170 Afghans. When President Biden took control of the White House, the world was at peace and our enemies on guard. Since the disastrous withdrawal of Afghanistan showed our weaknesses on the world stage, Russia has invaded Ukraine, China has dramatically increased its aggression in the South China Sea against Taiwan, and even the Philippines, Hamas has launched a horrific attack against Israel, and the Houthis are launching attacks in the Red Sea, openly attacking US and allied service members in the Middle East. You both previously testified that you recommended maintaining a small force in Afghanistan instead of a full withdrawal. General Milley, you have also previously stated that the withdrawal was a strategic failure. Was it less problematic to defend Bagram Air Base than H. Kaya? And why was the decision made to give up Bagram Air Base which, for which we could do counterterrorism and better to protect than in the middle of an urban area? I'll let General McKenzie talk the specifics of Bagram, but Bagram was not a feasible course of action keep open once a decision was made to withdraw U.S. forces below 2,500. Um, and Frank can talk through the numbers, but uh, to, to maintain security, to maintain Bagram as an open air base would have required a brigade combat team. You're looking at 5,000 plus, plus a battalion to patrol the 30-mile road between Kabul and Bagram. So now you're looking at 6,000, uh, and then you're still going to have to take care of H. Kaya, which in the end ended up being 6,000 Americans, 2,000 internationals and others, so about 8,000 for H. Kaya. Uh, so you're looking at 15, 20,000 people. If your strategic purpose is to withdraw from 2,500 to zero, it doesn't make, it doesn't pass the common sense test 
to then increase to 15,000. I'm going to reclaim That's my a time. Can, issue. can either of you provide U.S. intelligence? It was woefully ina inaccurate in predicting how quickly Afghanistan would fall to Taliban control. Was this willful neglect of the Biden administration, the State Department, if you advise them that their potential for a fall would be rapid? We, we the United States military, uh, consistently indicated that there would be a likely collapse of the government and the ANSF upon a full withdrawal of the United States military. And we estimated that that would be months, not in August, months. We, we thought, at least I thought, it would be sometime in the late fall, Thanksgiving, Christmas. I extended that out to maybe spring, could get past Christmas and into spring. The intelligence community estimated anywhere between 12 and 24 months after the full withdrawal of the U.S. military. And was there a recommendation to the Biden administration, the State Department, that there would be a strategic intent and benefit of keeping Bagram Air Base uh, and uh, troops within uh, Afghanistan? I'm not sure I understand the question. Was there a value to maintaining a presence in Afghanistan and Bagram Air Base? Well, I thought that keeping you'd have to have at least 2,500 if you're going to keep Bagram. So I thought, uh, personally, I thought at the time, my assessment at the time, and I've said this publicly before, uh, that keeping 2,500, the value was to buy time to achieve the conditions of Doha and a negotiated settlement between the Afghan government and, and Jeroa. Presidents are in positions to make very difficult decisions. And I'm looking at this from a military standpoint. Two presidents in a row, much wider angle of view, taking in much more factors than I do as a general. Uh, they both decided the same thing, just with different times. Well, well, General Milley, with all due respect, yeah. even as a nurse in the Army, I had to push back against majors and lieutenant colonels and colonels and generals who were recommending things that were in, my, in our patients, yeah. not in their best interest, and would have cost them their lives. Right. We expect to have pushback from the military when a State Department or a commander-in-chief is doing things that are not in the best interest of this country and in the best interest of our service uh, men and women. For many heated, so, lengthy uh, let me discussions just and debates. Let me end here with recruitment That's down. Will we have to wait until November or January 2025 to finally get accountability for the disaster? We have to go to withdrawal? a classified briefing. Please make this short. It's been a long day. Wrap up your question. I'm sorry, I just did, Chairman. I just said, well, we have to wait until November or January 2025 to finally get accountability mm -hmm. for the dis disaster disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan. With that, I yield back. Thank you. I'd like to recognize the ranking member for a closing statement. Again, I want to thank uh, former Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and General uh, Mark Milley and former Commander of the United States Central Command, General Kenneth McKenzie, Jr., for testifying before Congress again and providing vital insight as this committee continues to use its oversight authority on Afghanistan, including its, its withdrawal, but including our oversight. Your testimony, I think, reinforces the need to have bipartisan, good faith oversight for over our, for our 20 years in Afghanistan. I believe that the American public and our service members and those Gold Star families, the 13 at Abbey Gate, but also the, there's over 2,461 that lost their lives at our 20 years during our 20 years in Afghanistan. The American people deserves nothing less. And I would hope and I would join and I will say to those Gold Star families here whose hearts I really feel that I will stand on to make sure that we do the 20 year investigation so that we can get and find out what we did right, what we did wrong, for the benefit of everybody in our military. And I think in order to do that, we need to do it not in a political way, but in a bipartisan way, and clearly from the testimony of the generals here, 
It is investigating what took place during the Bush administration, the Obama administration, the Trump administration, and the Biden administration. And then and only then will we be able to make that account to the American people in a thorough and non-political and bipartisan way. Now, thank I, you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the ranking member. We did establish the Afghan, Afghanistan War Commission on the National Defense Authorization, and it's a board of highly esteemed uh, people, just like uh, Ambassador Ryan Crocker, who knows uh, these issues probably better than anybody. Um, this is not a partisan group. I look forward to their recommendations. With respect to this investigation, we are focused on the evacuation. And so I do look forward to working with my friend on lessons learned and legislative recommendations to move forward to ensure that this never happens again. I think as we've heard today, it was the lack of a plan by the State Department and the failure to timely execute the plan that led to the chaos at HKIA and led to the suicide bomber, the Abigate terror attack. Um, that truth will come out. We will get the commanding officers before this committee and we will get the production of the sniper photos that Tyler took and we will get it soon. And so uh, with that, we're going to stand in recess as we move to the classified space to have the classified portion of the briefing. I apologize if I was a little impatient. It's been a long day. I appreciate your patience. But we really need to get into the classified space before the votes. Uh, thank you so much. We'll see you soon. Thank you.